So the latest prompt from StreamYard tells me that this show will not be recorded onto StreamYard, whatever that means. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to episode, what is it now, 29? 29 of Risk Chart Week. Uh, it's been a month since we last did one of these things. I uh, cannot believe it's been, it's been quite a while. Um, to think so much has been going on between then. And uh, we've, we've discussed Hong Kong Phillips auctions. And the last Risk Chart Week we did was all about dress watches. And that was that was intense. So we'll definitely cover that in more detail as the show continues. Just as I say hi to you in the chat, I want to share this on the screen. This is a watch submission that we're going to chat about at a later stage. And it's a really interesting one. And I thought it would be nice. Maybe I can full screen it for us to have a look at. That makes zero difference. I thought it'd be really nice to share this. You can enjoy the, the balance for the second. And let's get into the chat and say hi. I see Lazy Parasite. Welcome, Raymond, Eric, Blue Shirt, Horror Mirror, Watch by Design. Hi, Curtis. Uh, Justin, uh, who else? Lots of chat between Eric Hans. Welcome, Hans. Uh, we're definitely not going to chat about today's disappointment. Justin, Koji, Javier, Neil, and so many more of you. Thank you all for joining in, for being a part of the show, for spending your Saturday on the platform for a bit. We can have a chat discuss a few bits and pieces, and I see Thomas and Mark, welcome, and Chris, great to have you all here. We are definitely going to banter about all sorts of bizarre and crazy pieces, and the theme of how do you choose your next watch, I want that to you know, be the beginning section of the show, at least, so I will pause this and minimize it, we will definitely get back to it at a later stage, it's a Ulysse Nadan freak, which was pretty cool, and getting into the watches on the show, we have a ton. There's like 130 submissions, I think, and always oh, show sidebar. 130 submissions, so it might be a long one. I might have to coast through a couple of them and, and bring us up to speed. I was a bit lazy this week when it came to arranging things, so you'll find that there are a couple of duplicates here and there, but you know, the beauty is the variety, and there is some really quirky examples for the talk, which should be a good discussion, a good talking point. Uh, William, welcome, and the Chidge, and who else am I seeing? I'm missing out here. I don't know. Uh, Philip, I think I said hi to you. Okay, and Bobby Legs, I saw a second ago, and Turkey, welcome, Turkey Vulture. Long time no see. Okay, so where to begin? The theme of choosing your next watch. I will get to a comment made by Russell. He summed it up very nicely in the beginning, so maybe I can start with that. That'd be a good idea. It's something that's open to interpretation, very much so, and uh, it'll be worth expanding. I'd love to know your thoughts about this after the, after the show, for an example, in the comments, whatever you think. This platform, I try to make a place for learning. I don't know how well it works, <laughs> how successful it is, but uh, and when it comes to choosing your next watch, we all have our own perspectives and ideas around how we do it, and some of these pieces that we're going to see are new watches, newly acquired, picked up from ADs, taking a hit from the water, and get back into the chat. Sam Ray, welcome. I see that you've joined us in time. It's fantastic. And Kevin, welcome. Underachieving. Yeah, we're going to have a good time. Just give me a moment to get myself uh, into the driver's seat. The first 20 minutes is just me warming up and getting the, getting the throat all prepared. Uh, S, S White, welcome. Vincent. Okay, so how do we even start this talk? The cover photo. Let's begin with this. I just love it. I adore it. It's from Dear Artifact. I believe it's it's Father Artifact's watch. And the, the, the watch is just stunning. This Seamaster 300, they are still, I believe, extremely underrated pieces. This is not the James Bond edition, the, the what is it, the Spectre edition. This is the standard variant um, on a Omega NATO by the looks of things. And you can tell there are a few differences when you look at this next to the Spectre model. But even today, I think they deserve a lot of love and praise. Of course, these are super high-res images. So there were some great contenders for the cover photo, but I thought it would be nice to look at this watch just because it's great eye candy and also does fall into this category of choosing your next watch quite well that we can discuss further on. Uh, Koji, I think I said hi to you. You'll be, your watches will be shared in a second. And Bado, welcome. Oh, so good having you all here. Thank you. All right, so what is on the uh, the booze list today? It's the Tamnavulan again. And a Machu Picchu, <laughs> Peru, full body, uh, what is it, a, a percolated coffee, which is going to be nice. And a little watch on the screen. I was very lucky a couple of weeks back to pick up a Smith's W10 an original Smith W10. 
she's i would say a very honest example of one it's not it's not perfect condition those are very hard to come by and cost three times the price of this little piece but working like a champion scratches and all even patina and i'll try and get some shots to share this was taken very hurriedly today excuse the the dust and the scratches on the crystal and all of that it's a part of the charm and the character but this, in a way, I wanted to segue into the talk of choosing the next watch. Maybe I can throw a little bit of um, perspective or opinion around the subject. Most of you probably know now that I am a big fan of this model. I love the Smithsfield watch. It's a classic. This one's from 1970, so it's the last of the last. Great little history behind this, too. The story goes is that these were finally, you know, officially issued, I think, between 67 and 1970, and then they stopped. But... There is coverage saying that these watches also were reissued or served during the uh, the Falklands situation, during the Gulf War, and you know, these little machines keep on rolling. So yeah, it's, it's a great example. The patina is pretty even. It has definitely seen water in its life. I believe it's a military spec. It's a, sorry, should I say army spec? It's not, it's not RAF or anything special, but the case is honest and lots of little factors. I was just so happy to pick it up for the, for the price I did, especially. So when it comes to deciding on this watch, just let me try and cover that. And I'll get into the chat now while I leave this on the screen for a sec. Uh, oh, there's lots of comments. Andy, welcome. Let me just scroll up a bit. Again, tag me in the chat with a hashtag or an at symbol, and I'll be able to reach reach your comment easily. Uh, Patrick Valeria, welcome. Divjan, welcome here. Uh, wish there was a crown guard for this watch. We're talking about, oh, for the Seamaster. Not a bad point. Um, mezzanine, welcome. And many more that I'm missing. Everyone saying congrats. It was a really great find. I'm, yeah, chuffed with it. It's a super, my first vintage watch too, I should mention. Uh, Samray says, what do I think of the Christopher Ward Field Watch? You know what? The, the Sandhurst model, they took inspiration from this piece and it looks brilliant. It really looks brilliant. If you have a Google tab open, look up Christopher Ward Sandhurst. And as far as a, a mill spec with pencil hands and all those, I think it's obelisk hands, similar inspirations to this. Um, looks good shape for, yeah, for a 50 year old watch. Absolutely. So 1970, last of the last. The reason why I chose this at the end of the day is that the design speaks to me. That little factors we can address about the the similarities and differences between this and the modern reissue. But I've, I've been looking for one of these for quite a while and just go where your heart takes you, I guess. Um, in this category, choosing the next watch, it took me a long time. With most watch purchases, it's not a, an instantaneous thing, which I'm sure we will cover later on in the show. This one's taken a couple of years to decide on and to think more about and internalize that process when you're getting into this um yeah first foray into vintage was <laughs> chuffed to bits lazy fat yes i would say i am yeah i would say i am the greatest thing of all is that this was the last officially made in england watch afterwards they uh you know they didn't have english made movements i don't even have a shot of the movement to share with you but great nick cool little piece and before we get any further in i want to share what russell's <laughs> anything cost <laughs> samurai before we get in further i want to just share something that russell mentioned about watch collecting and he has some some cool insights just drop a 5370 to start the show why not um so he emailed this to me i think it was the last submission i saved and it was at like what 2 p.m this afternoon he always he thinks that uh, the next watch falls into four categories one is the planned purchase which is ordered and you have to wait for something sometimes for quite a while so the planned purchase that you have to order and wait for the second is a planned purchase you want but have to wait for one to come up and jump on it as soon as possible this might extend down the line the third is a spur of the moment you see it and you pick it up and the fourth is a repurposed existing piece where you modify it with a bracelet or a strap change um, which is the cheapest option he mentions and I thought this would be a nice, a nice little segue talking about, I mean, this is one of the most beautiful chronographs out there of all. I think we can all agree. It is just the epitome, one of, one of our favorite Patek Philippe's in the world, I would say. Right, and carrying on in the chat. I see Chaz is joining us, taking some more water in. Dry mouth again, because I'm still snorting, um, what's it called? Pyrenees, it's uh, antihistamine. Thanks to the hay fever. I just wish uh, Christopher Ward would make their case sizes a bit smaller. This coming from a 7.25. Interesting, RZ. Thanks for that. Watch Puppy. Welcome. Uh, William, great to have you here. And any more. I see Mooseman. 
and scrolling still. Again, I miss you in the chats. I'm going to try my absolute best to catch you if I can. Yeah, Dark Star, these, these are not cheap pieces. This is a really special example. So when it comes to your collecting strategy, are you the person who delays your time when it comes to choosing one? Or are you someone who is impulse bought when you think this is just it, just go for it, regret it later, buy it now? Um, are you the kind that that pays more attention to the smaller details, maybe sits on the idea for a while, does their homework before picking up the watch, those kind of things. I would like to know your your perspectives. And uh, <laughs> low figures, people fix it. Oh, is that what's going on? I didn't even know this was a thing. TPG, is he running a live stream at the moment? Yeah, good stuff. I, you know, I don't know anything about what goes on in the watch community half the time. I try and keep to myself if possible. It's difficult though. It is really difficult. Sam Ray mentioning the Calatravas are amazing. Don't worry, we are going to see some superb Calatravas later on. There is one, one of my favorites actually with a Hunter case back. Okay, so what else to share? Next up, we have a submission from Tyler, which I thought was pretty cool. We're going to see his pieces later. This is a shot of the canvas. He said it would be nice to promote your, your products a little bit. This is a shot of the canvas render that I did a while back that can be found in the store. Uh, the link's in the description if you're interested. But he's wearing the new Submariner. This has a great story behind it too. And I thought it was a nice bit of back play. There's nothing cooler than having the watch and then having the, the canvas print in the background, which is a nice talk. And anything else I've missed as far as the introduction goes? We've been running now for how long? Almost 15 minutes. Good God. We haven't even started. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, Tyler, thank you for this. We will get to your pieces later on. Send some awesome shots in. Let's start down to earth. Let's, these uh, submissions are from Abdul. Abdul R. Watches. He's normally in the chat. He's normally with us. He's a great guy. He's very, his feedback is awesome. He shares a lot of cool stuff with us. Um, so compared to the last show that we did a month back about dress watches, it was by no means the most, sorry, it was, it was the most heavy hitting series of watches we've seen, probably the most expensive collection of watches we've ever seen on a wrist shot week show. And I didn't actually intend it to go that way, but surprisingly it did. So this one brings us back down, down to earth. I would say we're going to get lots of vintage. We're going to see Rolexes, all the usual bits and pieces, but also lots of peculiar outliers, which is going to be fun to talk around. Lots of 70s inspired pieces and all of that. Okay, a comment from Stephen saying, I tend to sit on it for a bit, although I did buy two new Tudors, Silver Black Bear 58 and Chrono Black Dial in one week. <laughs> and we all have those moments of relapse, Stephen. I understand that for sure. Uh, your perfect sentiment has a good, your, per what? your perfect has a good sentiment that. I've tried adopting research and desire a watch for at least six months. Yeah. You're perfect is a fantastic channel, by the way. Great Instagram. Excellent guy. I love his stuff. Thanks for that, RZ. Yeah. I mean, I'm one of those. I'm in the same boat. It took me three years to pick up my first luxury watch. I really sat on it for ages and thought about it to a, a great extent. Okay. So we're chatting about a basic date just 36 mils, fluted bezel, jubilee, Roman numerals, the way it should be, I think. It has a slate gray dial, I believe. Stunning little example. And another nice thing which I really enjoy about this is the Romans are not flashy. They don't have serifs. They're nice and clean. It's a very simple dial. Actually works extremely well with the obelisk hands on this model. It's clean, smooth. Now, I remember him. He did a show on Watch Talk with the Punters, I think, a couple of months back. That's with Thomas and, and Blue Shirt. And he discussed the pieces that he has. And they all have sentimental ties and values and... Um, He's collected them over time. So I'd be interested in expanding on this more if he does catch up with the show or whatever else, if you'd like to share more. But he does have a few more that we're going to have a look at. Next up is, can you believe we're starting the show with Rolexes for once? Uh, an Explorer 2 white dial on a rubber B strap or an Everest. I can, I can never keep track with the straps. It's funny enough, I think we have at least three, three Explorer 2 white dials this week. Don't know how that worked, but everyone was in sync, clearly. Uh, I, still have, I still have not bought my first luxury wash. Hey, Neil, that's not a bad thing. Still collecting Seiko. You know what? Take your time. The, the great thing about this hobby is the, the matter of time and taking time when it comes to choosing one. Because you want to make sure that it's a good decision, especially when you're spending. I mean, these are not cheap things. When you're spending lots of money, I think it's important to really consider what you want and why you want it and... That's good. Have a bit of emotion to the purchase as well. Okay, taking a hit from my Peruvian blend. 
got to say, it's nice having some percolated coffee for a change on the show. This is just a stunning example. I um, was fortunate to handle the last of the last of these five-digit references a couple of months back, and they are cool. They are so, so nice. Um, I just wish they didn't have the attention on them that they do now, unfortunately, you know, for, for us who want to own them. But it's what I like most about this variant in particular, the Polar White, is the fact that it's so recognizable in this category. Even though it's it's a white dial GMT, when you see that that arrangement, it's still entirely unique to the Explorer 2 at this point. And Neo, he's taking a hit too. Good on you. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's just it's just that it's just that thing. It just works so nicely. And as a summer watch goes, nothing beats it. Really spot on. Next up from Abdul is a Nomos Club. I think it's a club. Or it's something else, or it's a neomatic, or so I can never bloody keep track of nomoses and then ends. I believe it's a cut, and that's to do with the, um, the the Arabics at the top and the Romans at the base. So this being, you know, the perfect watch, or perfect watch when you go to college, all of that. I think it's on a Perlon strap, I like the color variation where you've got the red, black, white accents, tuxedo, sporty. The GMT hand is not orange. Yeah, Raymond, that is the downside. Huh? It's red. That's the downside of those early five gens is that they didn't have the orange hand. And luckily, the new ones have picked up on that and, and made them a lot better. You're going to see a modern one later on. Uh, is the 2021 Explorer 2 Samurai? I, I missed that, that beginning part there. Catching up with you in the chat. I'm going to scroll up a bit and, and meet up again. We can definitely discuss the, the rugby hands a bit later on, I think. It would be, it'd be worth it. That was... Um, was interesting, to say the least. Uh, Nine twenty, the Explorer. Yeah, sorry, sorry, I'm missing half of these lines. Um, no fisherman's friend. Don't worry, Neil. There is fisherman's friend in front of me. It's only going to take about an hour before that that starts going. Right, and what else? California Dell Club Campus. Thank you, Vincent. That's it. Proper Roman four. Very good point. And in this case, it works. I don't know. Actually, it would probably look better with the watchmakers for because the, the extra lines would match up with the, the eight position, don't you think? I enjoy it. California dial, of course. Thanks for that, Raymond. But these are cool pieces. I think they have like 100 meters water resistant. They have screw down crowns. Um, just excellent watch. Getting into the hobby, I think it's great. And Nomos makes good watches. Let's not bash the brand at all. I mean, 1995, I think they started all in-house and their pieces command a very reasonable price the fact that you're getting an all in-house watch abdul welcome we're just chatting about your pieces here and yeah <laughs> black dragon says recently diagnosed with obsessive watch disease owd that's a win i love it tim saying great value welcome tim absolutely one of the best value for money pieces in fact one of my favorite chronographs is featured in the show of the watch i own and it's going to be good to talk about that because it's also one of the best value for money watches out there today. Nomos is a good brand. I think it's one you can get into, have some fun, enjoy the dress watch experience and the Bauhaus minimalism. They do some good stuff, to say the least. And we're going to look at some more of these kinds of examples later on. Okay, getting to the next one. I have never seen one of these before. This is a Zen Pilot chronograph with a salmon dial. I, I didn't even know they did this, but it looks outstanding. And this is a proper salmon dial. This is not pink. This is you know, the actual salmon color. I'd love to know more about this piece, Abdul, if you'd like to share. This one, out of all the pieces that you sent in, this one definitely caught my attention the most. Uh, stunning. So 356, Chaz, I think you have one. You would know. Thank you. Yeah, salmon dials, as we know, are hot items. They are collectibles, but never seen it on a Zin. So it'd be nice to hear. Also, there's an Easy M coming up just now. And... God, makes me think that would be such a nice watch to add to the collection. <laughs> so, yes, I mean, the problem with these shows is they do make you reconsider your choices and they do make you think more about what you want to add to your collection. So that's going to be the case throughout the show, I think, because tons of outliers, Parmigiani, Breguet's, Tudor North Flag, Seiko Alpinists. God, it's just it's a mishmash, to say the least. OK, hitting the coffee again. Great arrangement, too. I love the fact that this has numerals on the dial. I'm a sucker for chronographs and numerals. Stunning handset. Yes, pencil hands are the business. Love it. Copper dial. Eric saying 4-1. Are we talking football results now? Don't know. Uh, the Zen is, is sweet. Sure is, Tim. Uh, Valeria. Anyone have the Omega Railmaster 40 millimeter black dial? Really considering. 
I've been looking at some. They are great. There's some really nice examples up there today that you can look for. Ten pole tutor. I don't know what I'm missing here. Again, if I do miss your comments, just repeat yourself and I'll be able to catch it. <laughs> Raymond, forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. That's it. I mean, we all deserve to sin once or twice in our lives. Um, I'm considering selling my pots and pans to buy watches. Black Dragon, that's not a bad thing. That is not a bad thing. You only need one or two. Let's be honest. One or two pots and pans and you're good to go. Stunning. Stunning machine. Okay, carrying on. Great symmetry I saw mentioned on the dial. Yes, it is, Chaz, for sure. This this arrangement, this offshore, what would we call this this dial arrangement? The offshore setup, we see it from a lot of watches through like the, the 80s and the 90s with the day-date complication. Yeah, it's not for everyone, but great arrangement, simple to read. And there is this, you know, clockwise motion of how you would read the chronograph too. You've got your running seconds, you've got your 30 minutes, and then you've got your 12 at the base. Okay, carrying on. Definitely going to chat about this kind of chronograph at a later stage. Another shot from Abdul. This is a Tudor. I called it the ETA because it's got a self-winding movement. And this is where I wish Tudor would return back to. You know, it's just these little quirks that I think made this watch so charming. And, and I think Tudor now, its its identity has changed. It's moved in a different direction where we're not going to see the rose on the dial or the smiling self-winding anymore. This was how they, they kicked it off. And, you know, the, the, this watch has been around for how long? 10 years almost. No, 2012, this watch was introduced. It's a crazy to think the Black Bay has been around that long. And yeah, unfortunately, the, the brand identity has changed. You don't have the, the flower anymore. You've got a shield. Smiling self-winding is too polarizing, so it's all straight lines of text. And yeah, and of course, it's a gilt dial too, which is something special. Burgundy bezel, lots of little factors to enjoy. I think this is what made Tudor charming back then. Um, does anyone know the history of the snowflake hour hand? Blaine asks. I don't know much. All I can say, what I've learned from studying about it is um, it was a requirement, basically. The, I think it was the French Navy that actually pushed for the development of the snowflake hand. They wanted to make the watch more legible. From that, so the dial became the snowflake that we know. And that's how the, I'll never get these references, the 94010 and the 7016s came to be. Um, and now it's a part of their identity. I wish they had other variants of their hands. They could do some amazing stuff with just pencil hands. They don't need to be snowflakes, but that's that's their that's their arrangement today. Tudor Prince dates are amazing samurai. They sure are. It's too polarizing, says the brand that only uses snowflake hands. <laughs> right? Right? Uh, thick, though. And he says, yes. I mean, case thickness has always been an issue with these examples. Um, and, and the case itself is not exactly inspired. It's a bit of a slab. You know, it's, yeah. So out of all the criticisms, I think when I experienced the 58 blue, all the criticisms, the one was the case height felt unnecessary for what the watch is. They could trim a couple of mils off that. Um, but everything else is great. It's it's just a banging working machine. Wasn't Snowflake for legibility? And yes, that's it, exhibits. That was the idea. Increased legibility on the wrist. They were still using 39 millimeter watches back then. So all of that factored it in. And it became an awesome machine. Um, yeah, there's a couple of videos on the page, recent ones. The French Marine National video I did a while back, and also the new Tudor Marine National, those predictions. Uh, still good, still good. These ETAs and somewhat thinner, are, are they really? And somewhat thinner versus the in-house. That's interesting, Charles. Thank you for that. Okay, carrying on through, we've got another vintage date just, and I believe this is Abdul's, one of his favorites. This is a two-tone, I think it's his first, if I believe, I remember. It was his first date just he ever picked up, and it has a special place in his heart, in his collection. I love the rubber strap integration on this too. Is that that Get Carter feel to it, you know? Uh, but I also love the fact this watch is probably from the, the late 80s, early 90s, and feels right at home with this arrangement. You know, you've got that two-tone gold finish, which is subtle. Look how tiny that fluted bezel is. It's just nice and simple. Pipan. Is it a Pipan, Turkey? Thank you. Pipan dial. It looks like it is raised six, uh, 1601, right? Yeah, yeah. There's just so much to take in and enjoy here. This is what I think the date just is missing a lot of today. The, the, the simplicity of the smaller fluted bezels and the batons, the hands were just simple, nicely done, out of the way, discreet. Rolex, classic Rolex was always built upon discretion. Today, nah, don't know, they're a little bit show-offish. 
<laughs> Great film. You're a big bloke. Yeah, was good. Was good. I loved Get Carter. It's an awesome film. Let's hope Tudor delivers on the new MN release. I hope they watched my video. Ugh, you know, Chaz, the they the watches are fully produced by now. The the lead time between you know the production of that watch is probably well over a year. So I'm sure at the end of the day, all they need to do is put an MN stamping on the back of the watch, case back, ship it out. They don't need to do anything else. As much as we would love to see the snowflake, and it's the perfect opportunity for them to bring out the snowflake dial at, as an unveiling. I mean, yeah, what are the chances? Anyway, love it. So, Abdul, thank you for sharing all of these. A really great way to get the show started. Uh, the four looks amazing. We're talking about on the date. It sh looks great, Samurai. I agree. Typeface. I mean, classic Rolex did typefaces so differently too back in the day. Yeah, lots of things to take in and enjoy. The Datejust is my favorite model. Um, if I was to collect only one model, it would be vintage Datejust. Abdul, good choice. I didn't even know if this is 36 or if it's 34. It all depends on the year it was made. All right, so we're carrying on through. Abdul, thank you. We're jumping to Alex next. Alex with an E. And he is having a meal with his Patek 5227. Now, he mentions... He mentions in the email that it's an R, like as in rose gold. But in this lighting, it looks it looks white gold. When I turn, when I show you the movement in a second, you'll see a bit of a difference. We we're chatting about Calatravas earlier. Well, we have one. <laughs> it's a good way to start the show. Uh, and these are some of my favorites. I really admire how these were done with the the large seconds hand and the hobnails all around the dial, the framed date window. All these little things taken. The fact that there's a baton accompanying it on the right-hand side. Spin mouse. There we go. Uh, I do like the crown guard variant a bit more. But in saying that, there's there's lots to take in and enjoy. Uh, Kelly Tar Tarava, that's it. That's it for sure. Um, and I'm, I haven't even said hi to half of you in the chat that I'm missing. Let me try. I see Crappy joining us. Welcome. Uh, who else? Roar of the Tiger. Uh, anyone else that I'm missing? Yeah, Joey, I don't think I said hi to you. Yeah, for all of you who are joining in, welcome. Your Saturday evening or Sunday morning, wherever you are in the world. I hope you've had a good couple of months break, a good few weeks, I should say. It's been a it's been a wild time. And uh, I'm sure since most of us in the Northern Hemisphere are experiencing summer, or what's supposed to be summer in the UK, um, we've been getting away from watches a little bit, enjoying time outside, enjoying a bit of traveling here and there. Yeah, it's all good. It is all good. So really dig this model. And if we jump to the case back, this is where it shines. The Hunter case back is so charming with this piece. So Patek movement, very simple, automatic rotor. Patek Philippe seal at this stage. We discussed a lot of these in the past. There seems to be great love for the officer case back arrangement. I haven't even asked if you can hear me okay through the, through the chat. <laughs> Uh, we've been running now for, what, 30 minutes. So I think I would have been called out for it by now, wouldn't you reckon? Taking a hit from the Peruvian again. There is the stripper, Justin says. Speaking of which, um, really funny. If you're into rugby, one of the positions that a rugby player is called is a hooker. Okay, They throw in the ball when there's a line out. It's almost like a, a throw in in football and soccer. So an American article basically auto-corrected the word on the title from hooker because it's a it's quite a obtrusive word and turned it into prostitute. So when they when they covered the hooker, <laughs> so bad. I mean, tell me about bad reporting. An American article covering rugby hookers and they call him a prostitute. So I don't think that's going to be outlived very long. <laughs> Give blood play rugby dog star says. Uh, sounds good. Thank you, Sam Ray. That's good. Imagine a silent slideshow. Vincent, we've done it before. Trust me. I mean, there's Murphy's Law that happens here often. They, we've had power cuts. We've had thunderstorms, rainfall, um, no microphone plug in. People are asking me if I'm presenting from the can. But no, uh, it's sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't. I love it when my internet just turns off. And then you're left just listening to nothing, seeing this on the screen, and that's it. Uh, Tom Young's, I think that was it, Eric. It's just beautiful, just beautiful. Okay, the office case, the office case back or Hunter's case back is always is always if the case is precious metal. Yes, yeah, it's an extra it's an extra buck you're paying to get one of these too. So that's something. Five out of five, William. Thank you. Um, very true. Didn't expect that to be an auto, Joey. Yeah, these models are um, no hand wind. That's what makes them special, actually. These models in particular, the older generation of Calatravas. 
I don't know what the newest ones are about, if they're going in a different variation, but I believe they're all hand-wound. Okay, we're carrying on through. This is now Alex with an I, not Alex with an E, Alex with an I. And he sent in some quirky examples. We have a Speed Sonic Omega Chrono. It's a little bit blurry, but you can get the gist on a Bond NATO. Talking about the arrangement of the subdials again, we are seeing this up-down verticality with the day date. This being a quartz movement by the looks of things it has a frequency set up here. I don't do not know the specs on this. Maybe someone can help. Uh, it's got a tritium dial as we would expect, and just an awesome another serious outlier in the Speedmaster category. And speaking of which, we are going to see lots of them through the show. New ones, old ones, Hesalites, sapphires. Uh, Sam Ray said, "So sad. You have to censor yourself for the for the yeah for that word, the Great Depression. Yeah. So it's just a precautionary thing you do." Um, the algorithm picks up, basically, as I'm talking to you now, the algorithm is going to transcribe every single word I say, and you're going to be able to see this as subtitles once the show is finished. And it can do all sorts of funky things if you start saying whatever, whatever. It shares, it shares links to other channels and other platforms, and it puts you in a different category. It takes you out of watches and puts you in a different catalog, and better be safe than sorry. That's, that was it in a nutshell. Um, you know, we try, at least I try to be as politically correct. It's very difficult to be because that's, you know, me as a person, I'm not the most censored person of all, but, you know, that's it. Uh, when I played for the USMC rugby team, are you kidding me? Um, I was in the scrum, the prop position. Were you tight head or loose head? Watch by design. I'd like to know. That's awesome. Really nice. Yeah, rugby is a, is a fun sport. Today's game was rubbish. Uh, Lions versus the South Africans, but you know what? We don't have to talk about it. Smoking brisket must have a large rizzers. Hans, great to know. Um, love those pushes. There's some good little factors to take in. I really enjoy the dial arrangement here, actually. The larger batons. We so, we so commonly see the Speedmaster with painted on batons, not applied. We see the, you know, the, the penis 12, the upside down. Uh, which doesn't work all the time for us. It's a part of its trait now. But I mean, you know, when you look at other dial arrangements, some can look better than others. And yeah, looks good. Really nice setup. But there's more, more peculiar <laughs> tale of two, just in the tale of two halves. Yeah, absolutely, man. Uh, okay, let's jump to the next one. Thanks for this, Alex. We're jumping to a Maurice Lacroix. I can never get the name right. This is a superb looking chrono. Flyback chronograph. Look at the, the numerals on the dial. Look at the balance there. The date has a Cyclops magnifier. I mean, what? And zooming out, I'm trying to make, this looks like a wood planer it's resting on. That's cool. Talk about a work watch. This is a stunning piece. Large date. I didn't even notice that. Yeah, I mean, if I could sum up today's rugby match, it was um, it was all TMO penalties and and interesting calls, to say the least, right? TMO was great. It was a TMO match. Yeah, that's it. That's basically um, when they play it on the TV screen for people to watch. Uh, nice block pushes. Second half was good. Hans, Hans, you enjoy the second half, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, the handling was terrible at the end. Yeah, it was a nightmare. I'm surprised that that Hamish didn't get carded for that that tackle on Larue. Got to say that was mm, interesting penalty. And all this. You know, anyway, we're not going to talk about it. So, talking about the the numerals on this dial. Reminds us of 1920s, 1930s aesthetics. We have that beautiful typeface, large extended deco-esque text. Check how the, the numerals are actually, what we call them, distorted on either end. The framing of the window is, is distorted in a perspective. We've got sword hands for the chronograph hands and for the, the hands themselves for telling time. Lots of little things to take in here. Tachymeters on the outside, it's subtle, out of the way. Peculiar. Never seen one of these. It actually has a stepped stepped lug arrangement or something else too. A cyclopsed month. Yeah, right. I mean, what is that about? What were they thinking here? Where do you ever see a month that's cyclopsed? The one that comes to mind uh, is the um the Seiko most Seiko dive watches in the new category. They have a, a large cyclops that covers both. But how's that? Not a bad setup. Nice and clean. Peculiar. I like it. Okay, next from Alex is a Polaris movement, and there's there's a fox outside my window that's screaming its head off. I don't know if you can hear it. Got some wildlife going on. Oh my god, that is so annoying. Okay, anyway, back to it. So Polaris, JLC Polaris, stunning piece, a thousand hour movement. Of course, that's the specification, a thousand hour control. 
10 bar. He didn't share the front of the watch. I think this was just a pickup. I don't know. Maybe it was one of his watches that he was sharing. But we can enjoy the <laughs> foxy lady. Foxes. Yeah, I've got some wildlife where I am. Foxes and hedgehogs and all sorts. It's a wild. It's wild out there. It's just wild. Uh, and Hans, yeah, no, it ain't Cointus. It's a, it's a, it sounds like a teenager, I think. It's a small one. Seen it around here recently. Um, simple, effective movement. JLC and their pieces, they know what they're doing. Unfortunately, they have done away with gold rotors on their models. And there's, there's something I miss about that. The beauty of JLC and their movements were these massive 22 carats or whatever it was, 18 carat gold rotors at the back that defined them nicely. Still, workhorse, you know these watches are built to last, built to work. I see Rick is joining us. Welcome. And many more of you that I haven't said hi to. Welcome, everyone in the chat. Uh, let us hear the fox. William says, yeah, I wish I could. It stopped now. It's just barking away. The first time I heard them when I arrived here, I didn't know what was going on. I thought there was like an attack going on outside. Uh, yeah, they should have kept the gold. Unfortunately, that's something they have dropped. But, you know. Um, if you can find the originals, some of the earlier generations from the 2000s, great examples to look at there. 22 carat was common. How's that, Mark? I mean, it's 22 carat gold rotors, just beautiful, just exceptional. That brands, that gives the watch that hallmark of being, you know, watchmaker's watchmaker. Let's stop with those cliches. Jumping to the next piece from Alex. Foxes make a strange sound for damn sure they do. Uh, this is this is a Senna chronograph, and I did not get any more specifics on this piece, but I believe, was it a model made in collaboration with Ayrton Senna, and this was an actual watch brand built around him, or was this an existing brand? I'm pretty sure he had a partnership with Tag Heuer back in the day, back in the 90s, no? So I'd like to know if this is, an, if this is a Tag Heuer or what makes this one special but first glance you look at it and you think ap offshore numerals i mean <laughs> look at the texture on the dial it's it's exactly the same the hands the the accents on the hands everything basically apart from the day date complication senna or zinna uh hans sorry justin says yeah i can read senna on the corner here and this looks like his logo i i don't know someone needs to fill me in on this uh it's crazy. And this does look like a watch out of the 90s or early 2000s, judging by the bracelets. So I'd like to know if anyone has some insider on that. Uh, we're not done yet with the crazy stuff. Um, the Polaris uses tungsten rotors, but I think the master range uh, still uses gold. Master control calendar still shows gold rotor. Thanks for that, Chris. The master series, master controls, the, the, the geophysic, I think also has a gold rotor. And they all have that, that brand of a thousand hours when it comes to testing. I love that. I really do love that. JLC should always give the option of a see-through case back. Yeah, I agree. Another good point there. So, so here we go. Julian's saying it's the 10th million speedy limited edition. Right. I think you're pulling my leg. I don't know if this is a speed master or not. Senna wore the SEL or the Cell 100,000th. Thanks to that, Neville. I did not know that either. Um, he, he, I was, I was one years old, I think, when he, when he went into that barrier. So, I don't know much about the watch history back then, but thank you. Keep on sharing that. I'd be very, very interested in knowing. Uh, watch screens 90s. Shaitan says yes, it sure does. I love the contrast on the dial, though. Nice arrangement. We've been running the show now for 40 minutes. We've barely even started. I've got to carry on. This is another shot from Alex. This being a, I've never heard of it before, a sauna, as in not sauna, like the, like the heat room, sauna, S-O-R-N-A. And it is a triple date GMT. I mean, this, is, this looks like something straight out of the 70s. So we've got your, your, your day of the week. We've got your, how does that work? August, December, April. What? So there's your, there's your the month, and then there's your actual date. It's funky. Ours. Look how it's arranged. And when it comes to using the chronograph, I'm guessing it's like a chrono stop in a way. I think that's how you would read it. And it has a, you're kidding me. Check this out. Johannesburg. What? When do you ever see that on a watch dial? Just geeking out here from, from South Africa. This is an old watch, got to say. I mean, the last time I saw, I've never seen Johannesburg on a, <laughs> on a chronograph before. Wellington, Azores, Carolines, Sydney, Tokyo. That's interesting. Really cool, man. Col Columbia, I think I see at the bottom there. Tehran. Look how crazy this is. So you have a bezel adjust. I don't even know what half these things do. One of these adjusts. Oh, my. 
this is crazy. So check this out. You have one turn for the, the, the world time. You've got another inset turn here for the inset white part of the bezel to adjust the, the, the hours if you want to use it like a Polaris. Then you've got chronograph hands that I'm guessing runs the chrono like an Amiga chrono stop. We're going to see one later on. And then you have a day, date, month. Crazy. That is a superb comp. I mean, that's just, it's an all-in-one. I guess that's what we're trying to go for. <laughs> Alex, thanks for this. this. This screams the 1970s, to say the least. World timer, Thomas. Yeah, it covers it all. It covers it all. <laughs> Joe Berg represent. Johannesburg. What? Why would they have that on the dial? Um, so Shaitan says the Shah of Iran was probably still in power when this watch was made. Yeah, probably. Crazy how this time times have changed. Yep. I mean, what? We're going to see a couple more 70s examples that are less strange, I would say, but also fall into this, this category. And I guess the easiest way you can tell that it is a watch from that time is the, the case, the television case style, the, the colors, the bright blue and red and all those, you know, the 70s were all about funk. And they definitely did that with their watches too. Funk was everywhere. Uh, wonder why it never took off, Eric says. Yeah, I mean, it's not for everyone, right? Uh, groovy logo. Yeah, of course. You got the S with the crown on it. What this dial arrangement is bizarre. I mean, yeah, day date is funky. What were they doing? 21 jewels. They just threw it all in there. They were like, guys, we've got to just chuck it all. Let's do it. I guess this was during the time of the quartz crisis. So they just thought, you know, <laughs> let's just go nuts. Okay, next up, Alex, thank you for this. We're jumping to, I called it Speedmaster Hesalite, but I could be wrong. It looks Hesalite. I didn't even check the, I didn't even check the photo. I just saw Speedmaster. This looks Hesalite-ish to me, judging by the crystal, but on leather strap, normally that comes on the Sapphire model. So maybe I'm completely wrong. I'm going to see a couple of these examples later on, the new and old variations. Got to enjoy the black leather strap on a Speedmaster Professional, timeless, great looking piece. And yeah, there's been some, some interesting criticisms of the modern variant, which I want to get to, actually sums up Mark P's discussion of the watch a while back, how he said the manufacturing is a little bit, eh, in some places, the tolerances, the sharpness of the bracelets. It's a one, oh, thank you, it's 1861 Hesalite, thanks for that, RZ. Getting down just for the funk of it. That's it, Chaitan. Getting down. Uh, it's great. It's great. I mean, a lot of you guys were around back then. So, I mean, it must have been a time. It must have been a time. And uh, Chatting about 1970s. I'm wearing the 70s Smith. It's Smith. It's crazy to think. Sly and the fam. Okay. So, we've chatted about Speedmasters enough on the show, but it's a great piece. And we are going to look at more of them at a later stage. Next up, we're jumping to BDEV. I don't know if he's in the chat, but I, I do believe that these are new pickups from him, recent pickups. Uh, no, this might be one that's been in his collection for a while, but it's the aerospace. And the Breitling aerospace, when you talk about value for money, bang for buck, getting into Breitling, enjoying is it the craze of the late 90s and early 2000s, this is one of them. This is a 2001 model, and the reference number for your entertainment is the E65362, 40 millimeters in size. So it's got an Annie Digi arrangement. We know quite a lot about these pieces, and uh, there's definitely a community, a cult following for this example in particular. And yeah, love it or hate it, there's there's lots to admire and enjoy. We have featured this exact watch a couple of times on the show in the past. The E17, this is called the E65, if that means anything, Hans. E65326, yeah, you, you get the gist. More Porter, no, Peruvian down, down the throat, going to get back in. This definitely screams Breitling. You've got the bracelets, you've got the case, you've got the bezel. All those little components add up nicely there. Breitling Aerospace, great everyday wearer. Yeah, as Thomas says, great everyday wearer. It's titanium. I, I Thank you for that, B-Dev. You're in the chat. It looks titanium. It's dark, dark and finish, lightweight. Lots to admire and enjoy. But then, you know, funny enough, B-Dev and Blaine, they're both in the chat. They sent watches in separately, completely. They've They've both sent in. Breitling related pieces. The one piece that really caught my attention as the show went, or as the saving went, is this Colt that just arrived, I believe. It arrived with him this week. And it's from 2016. The model is the A17388. It's a 44 millimeter watch and definitely does not look like it wears like a 44 millimeter. And there's something I really enjoy about these Breitling models in particular, with how they do the 24-hour the scale on the inside, as well as having batons, having applied numerals, the bezel is out of the way. Everything's brushed. The, the majority of the watch is brushed. 
as most of us know, Breitling has had their, their errors where they just polished everything like crazy. Here, at least, we have an example that looks extremely casual for what it is. And now we have a, you know, it's an aviation inspired watch for sure, but could double as an everyday wearer and has chatting about watch sizes is a shameless plug. 47 minutes into the show, watch sizes. Does it matter? I'm going to put that little link in the corner of the screen for this week's video. 44 millimeters. And look how well that dial's been done. It's fantastic. The space allocation for everything is superb. The space has been taken up nicely. I don't know so much about the six lines of text plus the Breitling logo. It's a bit excessive, but you know what? The fact that they're occupying the space pretty well and it doesn't look heavy, still easy to read. Yeah, notice the 24-hour dial. Love it. It's really, really cool. It's also a part of Breitling's DNA. And we're going to jump to an Avenger GMT in a second from Blaine. Okay, catching up with you in the chat. And I missed so much. I've got to take the dog out. Good luck, Justin. Hope it's not raining that side of the world. You can be my wingman anytime. Hmm. Yeah, Top Gun. That sounds looks like a good film, eh? The second one looks like it's going to be a winning formula. I hope it hope it works out well. I think they've been delayed with filming a bit. Um, Y'all ready for this? I don't know what's going on. Oh, it started drinking early. I mean, it is coming up to 11 o'clock, so I wouldn't blame you. Julian saying, any guys have a Doxa 1500? Just curious on how much longer the diver's extension is. There are a few in the chat who own Doxas. I think Eric does, and Blue Shirt definitely does. There's there's a Doxa nation in the com in the comments. So yeah, ask answer away. Uh, Mezzanine saying lug length is a bigger factor. Uh, yes, it is for sure. Something I missed when I was sitting recording that video. I think it was Monday this week. The room I was sitting in was a sauna, and it took like an hour just to sit down and record fifteen minutes. So I, something did slip my mind. I make footnotes for a lot of these, these recordings, but this one, I, I did miss the mark when it came to lug length. Lug length is the most important thing of all. Look at the Seiko Turtle case. 44 millimeters wears like a glove, you know, because it's 47 mils. You can fit it on any wrist size and it would work nicely. Bruce is the man for Doxa. Yeah, blue shirt. You can definitely share your thoughts on Doxas and their pieces. Yeah, Andreas asking, watching the Olympics. Yes, uh, on record at the moment. Just saving up whatever I can. And going to watch that tomorrow, hopefully, in my hungover state. Um, William saying, couldn't agree more. So many big dials today. Uh, just too much empty real estate. Yeah, we're going to see some during the show, I'm sure. Maybe this can be something in the back of your mind as we roll through some of these pieces. This one definitely takes the cake for being well-occupied. It might be too heavily occupied, all things considered, but then, you know, there's lots to take in and enjoy. I love detail with dials, and this one definitely has it in spades. Okay, going to carry on. BDev, thank you for sharing these two. We get examples of Breitling and how they have evolved between the early 2000s and, should we say, late 2010s. <clears throat> Jumping to Blaine next, and it's an Avenger GMT. Special edition. Hold on a second. I did not save. Well, this is a, it looks like a pearl dial for all I know. Lots of little factors to take in here. Um, I do really enjoy the arrangement. Once again, great space allocation. This looks smaller than the 44. This could be 41, 42. It does look like a mother of pearl dial. And if that's the case, it looks amazing. It does really look nice. Let's talk about light play. There's something about these models, though. It's that AR anti-reflective coating. You can either love it or hate it with these models. And I think Breitling is one brand that, at least in the early years, tended to overplay their AR coating quite a bit. So take that into account. But notice how they've framed the date window. The applied batons are very nicely done. The red accents are not too heavy. We've got it on the GMT hand on the it's a funky looking GMT uh, bezel. Not the easiest to read, all things considered, but then it is subtle enough that it's out of the way. Taking a feather out of the explorer's handbook. Speaking of which, we're going to have a look at a stunning Glycine Airman later on. Um, one or two pairs. I missed that one there from, from, from Eric. And Forbin saying, if Doxa did Bauhaus, would it be a dash hunt? <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm not awake enough. I'm not awake enough to read that properly. Is it Bauhaus, uh, bow as in as in like dogs bow, like when they bark, right? I think I'm getting somewhere, Forbin. I don't know. It is Mother of Pearl, Blaine. Thank you. That is something else. I really like that. More brands should be doing it. Next to the the standard um, meteorite dials that so many brands seem to jump on, why don't more do Mother of Pearl dials like this? 
because it looks textured, but from a distance, it still looks like a white. It's just like a marble finish. It's beautiful. Stunning. Again, with the four lines of text. Is that four? Yes. Four lines of text and a logo. That was Breitling's calling card back in the day, you know? Uh, yeah. And for something else, Blaine mentioning Paul Thorpe's Breitling's are all special editions. They can't sell them enough. Oh, that's his comment. I remember that from back in the day. He said, Breitling's are all special editions because <laughs> they can't sell enough of them. Yeah, that's it. Huh? Special editions. Yeah, roll off the tongue. Okay, we jump into another watch from Blaine. And this one, Bow Wow. Yeah, that's it. Thanks, Julian. I did miss that. Um, I'm a bit slow. I'm a bit slow this evening. I'm going to take another hit from the Peruvian blend. This one caught my attention, though. Oh, you don't see these in the wild very often. Easy M3, right? And he calls us the Easy M3F. I don't know if I got it right, right here. 41 millimeter case. 11 millimeters or so thick. Of course, this has the little argon uh, capsule inside it too. And sub 50 millimeter lug to lug. What a cool looking watch. It's so nice. You know, immediately after seeing this, I thought, you know, this will just add so nicely to a collection. There's so many things to take in here. Taking another hit from that coffee. Of course, the downside for yours truly is that he wears his watches on the right wrist. So that crown would dig into the hand. Of all the watches that you want out there, and this one decides it's going to go with the, the left crown arrangement. What a cool, and the photograph is also stunning. Blaine, is this a different Blaine that I'm chatting to? Okay, <laughs> see what I mean? Uh, later on, we're going to have Jonathan L's and M's and, and two different kinds of, it's, you'll, you'll see. I've actually had to add a lot of surnames in just to make sure that I can keep track of <laughs> who I'm chatting to. Blaine, this is not you who's, okay, got it. Thank you, Blaine. But yep, yeah, stunning. So these two different Blaines or the same Blaine? I think this was this was one Blaine. This is you, Blaine, and this is the other Blaine. Uh, I think <laughs> we're getting somewhere. As, as Andy says, lovely photo. Love it. Absolutely stunning. Draws eyes, draws eyes towards the center, yeah. The fact that the dial is so sparse, it's a typical German, German arrangement. It's so legible. You could see this in any lighting. Uh, the bezel, I believe it's a countdown bezel, which is something else. And then you have examples like the EZM 1.1, which has the chronograph. You know, it doesn't have any subdials. It's just a, yeah, superb, simple arrangement. Circle A, yeah. So it's it's AR as as for argon, and that's to do with a little capsule inside the case. I don't know where they hide it, but the capsule absorbs all the moisture. Any kind of moisture that enters the case gets absorbed by the capsule, and that changes color over time from from white to green. I think. And by the time it's green, it's an indicator to say that it needs to be replaced. So it is your superficial moisture collector. Most watches have moisture indicators where this one actually goes that extra step. Zinn is an absolute pioneer in so many categories. When it comes to you know that fully oil, uh, what is it, oil-filled watch, I think it's the UX, it's like 5,000 meters water resistant. It's quartz, but it's the most insanely water resistant watch out there. Then it has this, this argon gas technology. Tegumented steel. This is submarine steel. Uh, I don't know if this one is, but it's basically scratch proof. I think, yeah, I was looking at this. That's his arm here. This, this is very difficult to scratch. And you can get these for like 1500 bucks. You're getting an amazing brand when you go into these pieces. Would highly recommend the EZMs. In fact, I'm looking at some now thinking, yeah, they would make great... <laughs> Great to the collection. Thanks for that, Raw. Um, Florinert filled. Eric, you know your dive watches. You can expand on that more. Oregon dehumidifier. That's it, Eric. Got it. Got it. Uh, nothing superfluous about EZM line. Love it. That's it. Special. Really special. One of my favorite submissions for the show. Okay, carrying on to Shy Town next. I don't know if you're with us in the chat. I think I've said hi to you already. Seiko SARB035 on my lunch break in sunny San Diego. Wearing. Dock Siders, which is great to see. And we're going to see a couple of Seikos today. Um, no Grand Seikos, but a couple of pieces that ride into that category pretty well. We're going to see some Prospect examples later on. Simple, casual, understated. And yeah, this is what Seiko is known for now. They're doing some good stuff. They are doing some very good stuff. Yes, Chaz saying they're issued to police and military units. Yep. So enforcement in all categories. And, I th and of course, we have... Um, I think it's the EZM13, which is given to uh, Coast Guard. So many examples. They all have, that's another great facet to add. All of these models, I mean, 
Ein Sad Zemesa, I can never get that name right. Um, they all have their own categories. They all fulfill, regardless of whether it's police or uh, border enforcement, or if it is uh, we're talking about Casavac rescue helicopters. A lot of these watches are in service today by the German forces, which is fantastic. I look forward to discussing that actually in a future video, if we ever get to that. Uh, the GSG9. Don't know what that is, Eric, but thank you. Video idea on a watch dial has the best legibility, black or white versus white on black dial. Hmm, marine chronometers. Good point there, Kovacs. Yeah, marine chronometers were all about um, you know, white dials with blued hands, and blued hands were specifically made for that legibility factor. Very good point. I'd like to discuss that. Nice one. Um, very interesting there. Chino, we kind of chat about the whole outfit now. Chinos and, oh, it's funny. Turbo, welcome. We're going to get to you later on eventually. Uh, Thomas, great photo. It is a stunning photo. And it's, it's great to see a Seiko in the wild that's not a Grand Seiko. This is like that transition. They call this the baby Grand Seiko, I think. I'll never never get it right. Uren Sun, welcome. You missed a cracking German watch a second ago, so there it is again. Welcome to the show. And going to move on. chi -Town, thank you for this. <laughs> He's in the chat. Great to have you here, chi -Town, and thank you for sharing this. I like the fact that we're not looking at divers for a change. I think most of the time we see uh, you know, SKXs and stuff from you, so this was a nice transition away. And yeah, I love it. Next up is the rancher, Clive. I don't know if he's with us, but last week, the last show we did was all about dress watches. And his photo he sent ended up being the size of a thumbnail. I don't know if you remember, but it was like 90, what was it? A 1990s variant of the photograph. You know, it's all pixelated and stuff. So he said, let's try that again and let's have a look at this. One of my favorites in this category, the Omega Chronos drop is getting lots of love and praise and attention today. There's so much to enjoy here. So we're going to chat about this for a moment. Again, 1970s. Ben, welcome. Nice to catch the stream. You never normally catch it live. So welcome to the show. Ask questions away. We're going to have some fun. Turbo, GSG9 is a special SWAT police in Germany. Thank you for that, Turbo. And, and for mentioning it, Eric, uh, yeah, I'm missing size of an elephant. I know Zinn, I own three of them, Her son says. Uh, Saab, yeah, value of a year or two back. Sorry, okay, I'm going to carry on, going to carry on. This is a special example of the chronostop. There are a few variations. The more you know, ergonomical example doesn't have a turning bezel on the inside. This one does. So you have a simple crown adjust on the left to adjust the bezel in, inside here. The chrono stop is a bit of a funky complication. Doesn't have any um, any use beyond being used for a minute or two. But it's it's mainly used for timing when you're intervals on a, on a plane airstrip, or when you're sailing, you can use it for you know timing your your regatta. But otherwise, it's pretty useless. The nice thing is that this inset bezel does make it more practical. And everything about this watch screams the 70s. We have this precursor cushion case, uh, the hand set, the orange hand. Notice it says Seamaster at the bottom and Chrono Stop. At the, they didn't know what they were doing with the Seamaster brand back in the day. But another important thing to cover is that this watch looks, the condition is outstanding. And it's hard to find model like this, which is pretty rare in the chrono stop space in this condition. Nowadays, they are beaten, you know, snot is beating up, beaten out of them because they were used, bought to be used back then. So yeah, great piece. Love it. There are a couple of other variations in this category too, with a different bezel arrangement, but this one is definitely one of the grails in the chrono stop space. So well worth sharing. So thank you for sending this in, Clive. And uh, the Clyde stop. And Forbin, the next one is going to be even better because he, he asked me in the email, have you ever heard of this before? Um, Lawrence of Arabia. What a film, Justin. Amazing, huh? And so, I don't know how you guys go into talking about that, but awesome. I want the Chrono stop, maybe a remake. Well, you never know. I mean, they've done it before with the Mark II Speedmasters and those. Super interesting case shape. Yeah, I love it. Turbo, there's lots to take in and admire. Shatan mentioning that the GSG-9 was founded after 1972 Munich. Oh, good times. Um, it's a unit of German border police, yeah, because the military cannot do domestic law enforcement. Very good points. Thank you for that. David Lean at his best. Yeah, I love it. Uh, Lawrence of Arabia is one of my absolute favorites. Just just love the spectacle of it all. You know, this the grandeur. It's, it's amazing. Timeless. So he sent this email in next, I think, this week. And I should also mention Shaitan, as, as Mark says, thank you for that information about the history, border enforcement and, and military. Um, 
So this is a Icopod chronograph, and he wanted to know if I knew this brand. I most definitely do. It's um, it's an industrial designer's dream. If you're an industrial designer, you have to know about this piece. Uh, and you know, made by Mark Newson, he founded the company, I think, in the early 2000s. And he was one of the first. I'm going to go on record to say this. I've said it a couple of times. He was one of the first to use this organic handset. Today, Magic Mouse, come on, darling. This, this handset is now most commonly used today on FP Jones, but this is where it originated. Notice it doesn't have lugs, it has an integrated uh, rubber strap, and you can see that a lot of the motifs in this was translated into the Apple Watch that we know today because he collaborated with Johnny Ive when it came to coming up with that final result. So this is pretty much the precursor idea of what the Apple Watch would eventually turn into. And Icopod has since been sold off, I believe. They're, the watches are still fantastic, and there's some beautiful models. I think one made a debut on Kanye West's wrist, and all of a sudden it's now a hot topic. Um, beautiful dial textures, and <laughs> there's a spaceship. <laughs> it sure is. Yeah, there's lots to take in and enjoy. It's a Rattrapunt as well, something else to, to admire. Uh, lots of little facets. So it definitely speaks to that 2001 the Space Odyssey vibe, I would say. You would swear this watch is from the, the late 60s, early 70s, but no, this is uh, early, mid-90s to 2000s. So lots to take in. Check ignition, engine on, chatting about, that's uh, that's um, Major Tom, no? Um, Mark Newson Design, that's it, Julian. UK has a variant of GSG football supporters. Yeah, that's it, Julian. Talk about that. Um, this is outrageous, outrageous. I think we're talking about movie quotes now, and I'm missing you all in the chat. I'm going to try and keep keep on. Um, yeah, it's great. 70s vibe again. Hot Wheels, choppers, bike. Yep, that's it. Orange seconds hand too. How crazy is that? Also enjoy where the logo and everything's placed. Offset, out of the way. FP steals hands. Forbin, this is the belief that some of us diehards have in our minds, that FP Jean, in fact, you know, borrowed and did not credit this hand design from Icopod. Look back to the history. I mean, this is early, early 90s. I believe they were first with this arrangement, and it's just it's stunning. The handset, I, I really, out of all the things on this watch, the handset is what I love the most. Okay, I'm going to carry on, and we're going to chat about Curtis's new watch pickup. Okay, let's start with the Parmigiani Florier. I don't know if he's in the chat still with us, but we, F.P. Jean was inspired by Icopod. Kovacs, you heard it here first. Yes, there is definitely some merit to that, I believe. This is all hearsay. I don't know for a fact, but I do believe the handset was, was picked up. So we're going to talk about why was everything orange in the 70s? Urensan, anyone's guess. Really don't know. But it's just one of the things they went with. Bright colors, primary colors. You know. So Curtis rang me up, and we were chatting about his... You know, one of these final grail dress watch pickups. And we chatted a long, a long way about his his journey through this. And he he had a whole load of watches that he had shortlisted. He's still here. Good. Watch by design. He shortlisted a Patek Gondola. He loves this watch. Not a piece for everyone, but the case design screams the era of the late 20s, the 1930s. Lots to enjoy here. Breguet numerals and all of that. And also the Breguet Classique was another example. You could say that a lot of these pieces that he was looking at epitomize the brands that they represent. And I think that's a lot. That's what a lot of designers tend to do is we try and find that, that watch that sums up the, the aspects that defines the brand. So Breguet Classique, I mean, you can never go wrong. Um, it's absolutely beautiful. And at the end of the day, the gondola, as great as it is as a watch, it's, it's hellishly expensive. So... He was thinking more about it, and another piece on his list was the, the longer Saxonia Thin. But when he came across the Parmigiani, the one big de uh, detail is the fact that this watch is made entirely in-house. Uh, the only thing, he told me, the only thing that is not in-house are the, the rubies, but everything else from case, movements, all done, as well as the price is exceptional. And he got this brand new for like $5,000 or something crazy, and it's it's stunning it's a stunning machine also epitomizes the brand very well especially when you look at how the lugs are done typical arrangement of how parmigiani does these scarab legs i don't know how would you how would you describe them but lots to enjoy and i think he did also share a movement shot that we will get into so i think he's had this on the wrist for about a month now at this point 
And yeah, lots to enjoy. He picked this up on eBay on the other side. I think it was based in Florida. And it was a batch of like six pieces that were for sale. This this exact example. And he got us he got it for a song. And I think it factors in very nicely about choosing your next watch and what avenue you go down. This one was a very much a um a thought process getting to the final results, but then at the same time, the price was right. It's one of those cases when you're just like, you know what, gotta do it, jump on it. And we're chatting about Jagger and Warren Betty and I don't know what the chats just this is between Hans and Eric. They always have their, <laughs> their banter. Purple dial parmigiani, eggplant parmigiani. I mean, that's the way. That is the way. Um bras, they didn't wear bras back then. That's for sure, Justin. I can agree with that. And we get to the movement of this piece. I mean, look at that. Just take it in for a second. All in-house made. Micro rotor. That's insanely good. It does leave you questioning why so much attention is on other names when Parmigiani does this kind of stuff. Um, you know, it's in a similar category to like Laurent Ferrier and their pieces. This is one that is a serious outlier. It's white gold. I mean, AU 750. So what is that? Is that 18 carat? 18 carat white gold? Just awesome. So, so nice. Parmigiani is for sale. I believe so. Um, watch by design saying, this is Curtis again. I first considered 30 watches and narrowed it down to these four. Paid five and a half US dollars for this watch. New and box factory warranty. I mean, can it get better than that? It was a serious win. And this is a time when this is, fits in perfectly into the theme of the show. When it comes to deciding on what you want to get, where you want to go exactly, and you know, pinpoint what watch speaks to you the best. I hope you're really enjoying it still, Curtis. Um, love the micro rotor. Yeah, stunning. It is stunning. Thanks, Urenson. It is. It is 18 karat. That rotor. Nothing beats a micro rotor on these examples. It's just great. I'd love to know the accuracy too, if you'd like to share, but then you don't have a seconds. Oh, you do. You have a small seconds. Yeah, worth discussing worth discussing. Congratulations again, Curtis. We're going to carry on. This next gentleman wanted to remain anonymous, so I called him D, and he shared a stunning piece, and it's it's a peculiar one. Uh, Ulysse Nadan, we know the freak pretty well, and I did share a video of it at the beginning of the show. I don't know if I can. If I do this now, it'll pull me out of this uh, premiere page, so maybe I'll just leave it, but the, the Ulysse Nadan freak is not a watch for everyone. And you notice that the dial looks a bit funky. Zebra patterns, we could say. Uh, we will get to that in a moment while I address the chat. Raymond's saying, there is an identical one, 50 bids on eBay for 5.3. There we go. And I think it's all based in the States. There's someone in the States who has a, a stockpile of them and is selling them off for seriously reasonable prices. Uh, love the freak. It's a cool watch, right, Thomas? Another hit from the coffee. So this is the freak and it's uh, in in partnership with well they call it the x uh, razzle dazzle times razzle dazzle and you're wondering what razzle dazzle is it's a camouflage this was something experimented i believe with australia back in the day um this would be talking 1914 so early stages of the second world war first world war wake up dude and the idea was to try and break up the lines of the ship to make it less, uh, you know, appear on the horizon and, you know, make it difficult to detect on radar and all these little facets and factors. And they've taken the idea of the camo, which I think is crazy cool, and put that into a watch. And got to say, uh oh, come back. Got to say, it works. It really works. Um, yeah. So the question is, should more watch brands play around with camouflage arrangements royal navy eric i also believe i don't know if it, if if um the uk did it too as far as i could find i see at the bottom here it says um european war sydney harbor i don't know if it's australia or if it is the uk who did this but it was i think it was an australian innovation and the idea was i believe is just to break up the lines of it so it's less detectable harder to see on the horizon and when it comes to radar harder to detect they do that a lot with fighter planes today. They make them, actually warships themselves, they do split them up into different components so that the radar bounces off at different angles. But this, I think, was a failure. I don't know if it worked very well. <laughs> it was a concept. Uh, but I do love the fact that they've transcribed that into a watch design. And you know, the future is bright for this kind of stuff. It is 
superb. Watch by design. That's from Curtis. The gold version, like mine, has a platinum rotor. The steel version has a tungsten. That is so cool. So the model that you're wearing has a platinum rotor inside it. Um, done today in prototype cars. Julian, very good point. Yes, they do. Vanta black and then this zebra pattern to break up the lines so you can't really determine what the watch is. It's the car is. It's just a shape. DP, disruptive pattern. Mr. Mr. Eric was a part of the Royal Navy, so he knows his stuff. And we're going to carry This is a cool angle we get to enjoy. The Freak as a watch in itself. I think he, he picked this up recently. And it's a seriously underrated watch for what you're getting, too. Um, if Russell's joining in, he should very soon. I think he owns one of these. And, yeah, as far as outliers and watches that people don't tend to jump on or look at, this is some great horology for excellent prices again, too. So, yeah, got some craze going on. It's done on new bicycles. Really? That is cool. Super freaking out. Yeah. Great. So, D, thank you for sharing this. By the end of the show, I'll share a video of the movement again later on. Okay, going to jump to Dan the Watchman. <clears throat> I don't know if Dan is watching with us, but he has spent he's spent and shared some cool, really cool pieces with us. And this one in particular is special. For the Seiko nutters and the freaks out there, this one will definitely make you smile for a couple of reasons. Uh, Turbo, thank you for the super chat. Payment for the knowledge drop on Francois Paul being naughty and stealing the iCapod hand design. Yeah, right? Uh, it's great. It's good to get that news out there. You heard it here first, under the radar. <laughs> um, FP Jean stealing the, the Jean hands. I mean, sorry, the, the iCapod hands. Turbo, thank you. All right. So this is a 6.2 MAS, the original Seiko Divers watch, technically inspired by the original Blancpain Bathyscaphe uh, when it became more commercial in the 60s. But the cool thing about this one is that the previous owner, let's get to this, previous owner was a communication specialist in Saigon in the 1970s. So this watch was picked up in Vietnam during the conflict and has some provenance to it as well. I believe he traded, he got this watch a while back and has been considering trading it and he wants to know our opinions about whether you should keep it or not. And this watch should stay with you, man. It's a special piece. It's hard to find these today for good prices, at least this side of the world. I can imagine it might be easier in the States. 1965 launch, Eric says. Yeah, yeah. And and Justin saying very Bathyscaphe. This is it. Yeah. Bathyscaphe inspired almost to the T. If you look at 1960s Bathyscaphe, you'd be amazed at how this design basically copied it piece by piece. And then once they moved to the 6105 and really found their own footing, so the turtle was born and so it goes. Seiko equals Jody versus Pete at the moment. Yeah, guys are guys are going at it. Eh? I love it. Keeper, Philip says, yeah, I agree. It has provenance as well as it's just a classic. All you need to do, pop the bezel out, put a replacement bezel in, and you've got a superb looking example. Keep the original bezel got all that provenance. I believe this is the original strap. It sure looks like a strap from that time too. A stretch. That's great. We're not done yet though. Uh, Thomas left a comment about Dazzle Ships. We're painted in all sorts of patterns. Peter Blake, who did the Sergeant Peppers album, designed the snow. Oh, really? The snowdrop ferry across the river in Liverpool. Dazzle Ship pattern. Very interesting. Peter Blake designed the Sergeant Pepper album cover. And that was one crazy weird album cover. Huh? Thanks for that, Thomas. Um, Superb. Uh, did not. Uh, I didn't get to Nam until August '69. Royal Tiger says. Well, there we go. 1970. Yeah, beautiful, beautiful. We're not done yet, though. This was even cooler. Uh, how's this? Oh, Dan's in the chat. It's great. I love this piece even more. It's difficult, actually. It's hard to to decide on which I prefer. As much as I'm a fan, oh, I love them both. This is an original Airman. Okay, getting into the, the chat again. I missed you a second. Dan saying the Vietnam vet said he tried to give this as a payment for a lady of the night. <laughs> he tried to give this watch as a payment for a lady of the night, but she said no. You heard it here first. We, we cover all topics on this show. <laughs> uh, ben says, rest in peace, the glass. Yes, uh, the glass has, the acrylic has been uh, used through its life. So these pieces were 35 millimeters. R35 millimeters, I should say. Glycine Airman special, special. This is the original. Working hack wire, he mentions. And I've watched a couple of, I love the watch uh, repair videos. Watched a couple of them. And it makes a lot of sense when you see how the hack wire works in movements. 
and how it just needs to be straightened in most cases for it to actually hack the balance. Uh, so this one still has the, the wire intact, so you can, in fact, hack this movement. And we're talking, I mean, this watch was early, it was 50s, hey, 1953, 1955, and they lasted all the way through the Vietnam era as well. Commonly worn by pilots. Glad she did, Dan says. Oh, God, that's so funny. Uh, the loom is superb. This watch has never seen moisture, I don't think. It looks spectacular, spot on. Uh, of course, you can see the crystal has been used and abused, and the, the bezel has lost a bit of paint, but condition is stunning. Case condition is great. Lugs are nice and sharp. Love it. Going to hit the, <laughs> the coffee. And Julian says, Patek needs more hack wires. Why don't brands make their watches hack? I ask you all. There have to be some watchmakers in the chat. <clears throat> Hitting the coffee. It's so peculiar that watches don't hack. It would bug me, got to say. I love it when I can synchronize the time. <laughs> uh, love him long time, Justin says. Yep, that's it there. That's it. Explorer 2's grandfather. Yes. I mean, Andy, good point. Curtis, uh, watch by design, will agree on that too. That this piece really originated that 24-hour GMT bezel. Rolex just hopped on that bandwagon and put implemented this idea into their piece. This one established how the GMT bezel would be read. It's so cool. And Eric is already making predictions and Justin for 3.45 in the morning, 3.16 for Justin. You guys are bold. The wire does try uh, does try the dial, not, not the movement. Hold on. The wire does try the dial, not the movement. I'm not drunk enough to understand that. I'll get there eventually, Dan. Um, Monday. <laughs> you guys are the worst. Not done yet, though. Beautiful piece. I can't decide on what I prefer. The Seiko is stunning. I mean, the loom is fantastic, too. I've noticed now, when looking at watches in the UK, that it's so difficult to find pieces like these today. It really sucks. All of these, especially stateside, you can find them for a song. Uh, today, nowadays, this side of the world and Europe, there's some places in Europe where you can find them, but in the you know they're just so heavily priced, which is unfortunate. Last from Dan, the watchman, is a 14 carat Lacoutre from back in the day. Strange case, he calls it. And the first thing that came to mind was, in fact, Vacheron, because Vacheron did some crazy weird stuff through the 50s, and I believe a Vacheron case maker actually made this this style. And it was just uh, implanted with a, a Lacoutre dial, Lacoutre movement. But Vacheron was well known for making these crazy, funky looking things of that era. It looks so cool. That is just awesome. I love it. I love it. It's so out there. Uh, Forbin says, I like how those old Seiko hands are identical to the markers. Yes, yes, yes. Absolutely. Um, and the, the bezel number is elegantly thin like the Omega Seamaster 57. It's, it's crazy how pedantic I'm now getting when it comes to watches and handsets and the type on the dial and the batons and how they work, the length of the handset. I am scrutinizing everything nowadays. We go back to this model again. Look how little text is on the dial. Seiko, automatic, waterproof, uh, 17 joules. That's all. Batons, plots, everything works. Yeah, getting. Eric, exactly, right? I mean, I've always been a, a freaking anal retentive guy when it comes to this stuff. But there's so much you can you can take away from, from that, thinking about how the hands work on the dial and the space allocations and was thought actually put into this as well as everything else. Getting back to the Lakut, yeah. <laughs> the JJ Lakut. What a funky looking thing. And looking at the center of the, it looks like, they try to intersect the leather strap with a middle piece. Yeah, it's crazy weird. It's definitely the weirdest watch of the show for sure, but it's <laughs> it's cool. It is seriously cool. Okay, we're going to go back down to Earth. Well, technically not. We're looking at a Speedmaster next. So uh, very rare to see a 62 without water damage loom, Eric says. Yeah, chatting about the Seikos again. All of them were hammered back in the day, right? They were bought to be worn and abused and used as dive watches. So that's it. All right, back to Speedmasters. This is from our man, Dear Artifact, again. And as we would expect, the quality of the photograph is like 50 megabytes in size. So you can see all the little details. On a JB Champion bracelet, we saw this watch on the wrist of Mr. Bezos, I think, this week when he decided to take his commercial shuttle into space. All the billionaires are trying to fly. It's, it's weird. Elon Musk hasn't done it yet, so I'm guessing he'll be the next one to do it. Uh, so that's something. 
heard an interesting an interesting stat that I think the World Health Organization says that 330 billion is needed to secure fix world hunger. And you have to ask yourself, someone who is nearly a trillionaire, just a third of that wealth could make a big difference. But you know, <laughs> dear artifact is so considered. Yeah, dear artifact is knows his stuff. He is he is much loved on this page. I don't think he's joining us on the show, but. Uh, his photography is insanely good, and I love sharing it. The quality of his shots are incredible. And I hope he manages to pick up the new Explorer soon, because I'd love to share that on the show too. Um, up, down, splice flights are boring. Orbit the Earth, at least. Yeah, was that it? It was just, I didn't even cover. look at the coverage, Forbin. It was just out, out of atmosphere and back in, right? Um, Mark saying, well said. Yeah, I mean, come on. With that amount of money, this is like stupid money at that stage. It's beyond stupid money. You could do so much with that. You know, there comes a time when you say, you know, what's the point of it all? And there are plenty of people deserving of it today in this world of ours. So, you know, why not do some good with it as well? Yeah. But it's, it's a funny thing because I've, I've noticed the millionaires, they either are the ones who want to be the high profile people who are always covered by media and they want to like challenge each other and compete. And then there are others, the large majority of millionaires that prefer to just sit in the background and just not be a part of the show you know they don't need to show off what they have they just have it and it's the way it is timekeeper welcome and i see you've got a snoopy speedmaster there my next watch this is going to be good we're getting back on track thank you speedmaster and speedmaster let's just hit the coffee again <laughs> hans shares an eggplant i love that Timekeeper, thank you for the super chat. You said, my next watch will be more expensive than the previous one. Eyeing my next piece motivates me to deliver and keep focused since I'm self-employed. Huh, I'm getting the Rolex Pepsi white gold meteorite. Ooh, got the half mil collection. Ooh, it's, it's difficult. Huh? My choice, if I had the choice between that or the blue dial, I would be taking the blue dial white gold model. That to me just sings absolutely beautiful. But that's it. The, the white gold Rolex hits differently because it shows stealth. It doesn't show the color of the material. And that's awesome. I think that's that's a different collector category altogether. Uh, uh, Shaitan says, don't say the quiet part out loud. Only 300 billion. Yeah, Shaitan, exactly. Only 300 billion. Uh, <laughs> did, you <see? laughs> did you see the shape of the rocket? Oh, that was it, Hans. That was the joke, right? The, the shape of the rocket looked a bit phallic. Um, Father Artifact, welcome. Um, love my NATO strap cover pick. Yeah, for sure. The Artifact has the photography ability to allow everyone to experience the watch's details. I mean, let's get right in if I can. Take in the specs. There's so much to enjoy. There's so, so much to enjoy about this piece. The Speedmaster. It's just one of those pieces. If you're starting out in this hobby, get an Omega. You won't regret it. Omega is always going to be one that will last the test of time. Uh, can you imagine Bezos, Warren and Victor? Oh, the Bezos shaming is starting. This is going to be abusive. Um, <laughs> the Hans, oh, Eric's asking about the, the strap. Um, it is a JB Champion. I never remember the, the name of the... JB Champion was the actual uh, the pilot, right? The NASA pilot. And it's, I think, made by Forstner today. It's a Forstner strap. It's so nice. But Timekeeper, again, thank you for the for the super chat. And... When it comes to picking up GMTs, I think we have some later on. I don't know. We'll get there eventually. We're on E. Oh, God, we've got so many still to go through. What's the time looking like? Um, an hour and a half, an hour and 25. Okay. Okay, we can do it. We can do it. Let's carry on. Let's carry on. I see Shazbot joining us. Many more that I'm missing here. Okay. This is to Ed next. Dear Artifact, thank you as always. So Hulk Submariner camping. Ed went camping this past week, I believe, and he's wearing one of the most sought-after watches in the world. Did you ever think that we'd be saying that? The Hulk Submariner. It's a love it or hate it watch. Not for everyone, but you know. It's a cool piece. I admire the emerald dial more than I do the bezel, but all things in consideration. It's an anniversary watch, so it'll always get attention, and that's important. Shaz. Thank you for the super chat. Thank you so much. Thanks for joining in as well. Uh, we've we've been going for what now an hour and a half, and we're doing okay. We're we're on track. Uh, who knows how the show is going to progress? Um, ID coffee should be enough. Yeah, Hans, the coffee's good. Hey, I got to say, I'm enjoying it. Peruvian. Um, I don't know about the strength. It's four on the strength scale, whatever that means. But it's nice. It's even. It's not too heavy. It's not too light. 
Got some cream in there for texture. That's how you do it. Right, so we're going to chat, uh, carry on chatting about the Hulk. What else can we say? I mean, chatted about it so many times. And the collector space. I'm actually working on a video that should come out next week about the future of watch collecting. And that was lots of fun. I was chatting about things like how the authorized dealers are going to change and how uh, scrutiny is going to take place and how hopefully we're going to see production of more in-demand models to quell the hype and the attention that's going into the gray market and the price hikes that we are seeing everywhere. Jeez, like coffee is really doing its job. Amazing. Um, <laughs> carry on through. Uh, there's something ironic about people talking about how it would take a few billion to solve world hunger here. Imagine how much good you could do for your co community by selling your Submariner and donate. Kumaistra, I mean, that's it, right? It's quite, it's ironic actually discussing that on a show where we discuss these highly priced items. I agree. I agree. I come from a land of extreme poverty and it is pretty ironic to discuss it. It's uh, oxymoronic. Is that the word? I don't know. Um, yeah, the bees are shaming is happening. Shame. It is a superlative chronometer. I know I was saying. A superlative chronometer. Yeah. <laughs> Superfluous chronometer. Um, little something extra is that Peruvian blend. Yeah, Justin, of course. You know me. I add some white powder in there and it gets me going. Ed, thank you for sharing this. A great shot of the watch. I can admire this bezel when it's not in direct sunlight. There's, there's lots of charm to it. This being the older super case. And... Camping with this watch. I mean, you're brave. These pieces go for like what half a million now, I believe. Can't. Speaking of which, that that um that Batek Nautilus that went up at Antiquorum this week. God, that green, that green model. Whew, I caught some flack. Can chat about that in a moment. Next up, Eric. This is Eric W. Oh, speaking of which, Eric in the chat, I did not share your um your modded Seiko that you sent me. Oops. I am sorry. I'm very sorry. I didn't save it. Um, so this looks like an ale of some sort or a lager that he's enjoying. And he's rocking the Tudor North flag. An example of Tudor's old catalog that doesn't get the love appreciation it deserves. Russell's joining us. Welcome, Russell. <laughs> uh, glow and make men chunder. Did you hear the thunder? I don't know what's going on in the chat. I've obviously entered at a good time. Um, Mason, welcome. I've just found the stream and missed half of it. Don't worry. We've still got a long way to go. We've got, I mean, look on the left-hand side of the screen. Yeah, we've got quite a bit still to cover. It's going to take a while. Talk about the Tudor North flag. Underrated. I love the history of this watch, and I so wish they brought out another variant. The North flag expedition. Was it North flag? No, no. The North, North Greenland expedition. That's the one. Such a cool history behind that. I mean, it, it was right on the coattails or at the same time. No, it was even before. It was 1953, wasn't it? Or 52. Right at the time of the Everest summit. So Tudor supplied a huge range of watches to you know, UK-based scientists who went out and explored North Greenland and did all the things they would do there. Check out the plant life, the animal life, the temperatures, all of that. This watch is supposed to commemorate all that stuff. And they like barely covered it. So can you imagine they made a recreation of that North Greenland expedition and, and went back into that history and covered it? They would make a killing today, I believe. So anyone who's representing Tudor out there who's listening in, do that. It's, it's, a, it's a foolproof idea. Nothing beats heritage. And Tudor, your name is supposed to be around heritage. So yeah, goody. Eglantine and Francois, welcome to the show. The Seamaster Pro 300, James Bond, No Time to Die is, a, is really growing on me. Thoughts on this piece? We won't believe it. We're going to be seeing one very soon. We actually have one featured on the show on an Erica's original strap, paracord strap, and it's beautiful. I want to chat about it, actually. Well worth talking. Thank you for that suggestion. We're going to cover it. And any more of you in the chat? AMG, welcome to the show. Um, any more that I'm missing? I do not know. Tag me in the chat if you want to catch my attention again. I saw a comment about Force and a Band that I've missed. Lots of things to like about it. This piece has... We would say 2000s aesthetics with the big numerals, the, the date on the right. We have the power reserve on the left-hand side. It's a funky thing. It looks modern, looks classic. There's stuff to take in, though. I, I do like it a lot. So again, remaking a North Flag, call it the, just call it the Ranger. Do the right thing. Call it the Tudor Ranger. Give us what we want, and it will fly. It will fly. Uh, 
Carrie, Carrie, thank you for joining. And Lazy Parasite said, hi, Eros, welcome. Funny enough, you're up next with your Santos, which is going to be good. Andy's saying I'm a bad influence. Was meant to be early night, but yeah, now nice sipping Ardberg. I haven't even had a sip of the Tam de Vulan this evening, so I think I should do that. I've been enjoying the coffee too much. You know, the alcohol is supposed to give you confidence, but, you know, coffee does it good enough when it's uh, caffeinated. Well balanced, B Dave says. Are you talking about the arrangement of the subdial on the left and the date on the right? Yeah, I would agree. The white date actually works well here too because it, it matches the batons, it matches everything else around there. Okay, we're jumping to a Santos next. Eric, thank you for sharing this outlier. I don't I don't know if we've ever covered this on the show. I'm sure we have. God, 29 episodes of the show. I'm sure we've covered one before, but it's it's an awesome piece. Peanut butter. What's the Reese's peanut butter cup? <laughs> Love it. Karen on to Eros. Now, he mentioned to me that he is in IT, and you can clearly tell that by the screen in the background. And something that was quite flattering in his email to me was that he said his first luxury watch was a Seamaster 1957, which is amazing. And he actually got it because of the video that I did on the watch. That's I really hit home. Um, I've been wearing that 57 all week. God, it's good. I've had it for a year now, over a year, about a year and a half. I need to do a review, a follow-up on what it was like owning the piece. It's running, after the course of seven days, it's running dead on. Not one second fast or slow. Right, It's, it's insane to think how accurate those pieces are. This watch he picked up um, because he's having a wedding very soon, and this would make a great wedding watch, and he wanted to cover that. Speaking of which, any Cartier lovers, you are going to see, you've got a, an amazing selection coming up soon from Jonathan. He sent in five extremely rare and attractive models <laughs> he's a cartier collector and we're gonna love it you're gonna really enjoy it i'm super looking forward to discussing it he is right here at the base about what 15 posts away so yeah lots to take in here the santos is a gem and the first aviation watch the first sports watch one of the first wrist watches i mean you can't deny that history it's it's a beautiful i have the dlc version yeah just on there's some good stuff one of my favorites is that skeleton the modern XL skeleton, I think it's called. Yeah, looking forward to it. Eventually getting down the line. Imagine the North flag with different batons and numerals. Well, Forbin, I do think they should recreate it. Uh, Rizab, welcome <laughs> from Washington, D.C. Great to have you here. I don't know what time it is in the world where you are. And for all of you who are joining in, thank you for being a part of the show. There's, there's 150 of you listening in. Thank you all for taking the time out of your Saturday or Sunday morning. And... <laughs> Listening into the banter, beautiful piece. We're going to get to some amazing Cartiers. But Eros, thank you for for sending this and congratulations. Really, I mean, I, I feel quite flattered knowing that my my opinion on the fifty seven Seamaster influenced yours. And uh, it's it's a beautiful watch. There's just something I always go back to that Seamaster and think, God, this is the Seamaster. There's nothing that can really trump it when you think of it that way, you know. Okay, going to carry on through to Philippe. Philippe is a Seiko lover, his diehard Seiko fan, and he sent in the Ice Blue Alpinist. I can never get these references right, but he sent in a couple. I've saved two. Um, this is a funky example. Now, the Alpinist has always had an interesting rap. 7 p.m. in Washington. God, and it's it's like, what, 35 past 11 this side of the world. Hmm. Great dial color, uh, Russell says. I agree. Uh, Raw the Tiger says, my formative years were wasted in a Catholic school. <laughs> Given in a in New York City neighborhood and accessibility to Interstate 95, it was renamed Our Lady of Peruvian Flake. What? That is so weird. <laughs> Thanks for that roar. I love it. Love the history. Uh, Pepe, welcome to the show. Pepe D's Nuts. Good name. I like it. Um, yeah, so there's lots to take in here. This watch has so many quirks, so much peculiarity to it. You have you know, the, the funky numerals. You have the cathedral hands speaking about cathedrals and Catholic <laughs> Catholic churches. We've got a cyclops. We've got a compass bezel, which I don't know who would ever need to use it unless you are going hard out in the North Pole and you, you run out of all the ability to use technology. It's actually a real thing that you need a mechanical compass up there because everything freezes on you. Technology doesn't work. This model, I think, was a Hodinkee limited edition. Correct me if I'm wrong. They came out with this, this ice blue color finish. And the next watch he sends in is... A blue Smurf, I believe. I can never get these names right. It's a Prospex. 
it looks turtle-ish, but not really. It looks uh, SKX-ish, more like. It's a Japan edition, judging by the uh, the day complication. And this could even be a modded Seiko, for all I know. <laughs> Catholic high school girls. Oh, uh, boy, oh, boy. We do cover everything in the chat. Isn't that good? Isn't that great? Taking a hit from the coffee once again. Philip's asking about the size. I believe these Alpinists are 39 millimeters, or maybe a true 40 Something tells me they're 39 mils. Correct me out there. These ones aren't manufactured anymore. I don't believe. No, they are. This one has the yeah. This one has the prospects. This is the current generation of these models. They make so many of them. All the Seiko does today, as you can see in these two examples, is throw on prospects PX on all their dials. They're trying to make their watches more competitive in the space, and that allows them to up the prices when they use the prospects hallmarking and all that stuff. Yeah. The 6R36 movement, or 35, is a great movement too. 38 mils from, from D. Cahill, thank you for that. Hitting the coffee again. It's good, I'm being very uh, conservative with the coffee today. Yeah, double shot. Kentucky Fried Movie, I don't know what's happening in the chat, but that's always the case. And going to carry on through Catholic School Girls Rock. Was it, it's rock, it's not rule, right? Pretty sure it's rock, Mezzanine says. Okay, Philippe, thank you for these. We are going to cover more Seikos later on, I believe. I do believe. Now we're going to a, comp a serious outlier from Greg. He picked this up recently and was just drawn to the funk. And you can see it's the funk because it's from the 70s. Uh, vintage Bolivar, new old stock, automatic, with the craziest, weirdest bracelet you can possibly imagine. Fish scale, octagon. Lots to enjoy. I do like, I mean, the 70s was a time for bracelets. Isn't that a, isn't that a cool thing? In fact, we're going to look at some Royal Oaks later on, I believe. The 70s was all about bracelets. And here we see an exploration into the, the fish scale, uh, octagonal, whatever you would call it, male, chain mail arrangement there. And of course, this being new old stock, this watch is untouched. You can see the tritium dials and great nick tv case integrated i know it's just so true to that era that time <laughs> it has all the funk and he says yeah the bracelet is cool it is stunning and i would argue that the 70s you know that was the time when bracelets were really pioneered that was a time when they really started pushing that envelope to see what they could do and with a lot of these integrated cases and bracelets it, it forced them to be more attentive when it came to bracelet designs you know, nowadays when we see the Oyster cases and the, the Omegas and stuff, most watches today, like you, you could easily just take the, the watch head and attach a bracelet to it, where in the 70s, we see this, this idea of the harmony of some way of how these are done. Uh, 80s Red Hot Chili Peppers, that was it, right? That was it. I never, st I, I did, I do know a couple of tracks from Red Hot Chili Peppers, but I didn't follow them. I wasn't a diehard fan. Um, saw today the VC222 hammered for 50k. Ooh, Eglantine and Francois. Does the market understand anything to horology when they see the green? <laughs> that watch. Yeah, I was gonna, I mentioned it when we were chatting about the Hulk Submariner earlier. No, I mean, like, it's, it's demand. It's, it's a crazy, pro I've got a video coming out next week about it actually. This cyclical process we see where. Social media, platforms like these, the tangibility we get looking at these items. Um, at the same time, people want them more. The demand increases and they believe these watches are available to them. And, and so it goes. It's just this infinite loop. And my question is, if that's the case now, judging by a lot of these watches, how they're selling, what's it going to be like in 10 years, 20, 30 years from now? That's what I would like everyone to you know, give their feedback on. Because if, if it's going the same way, if it continues to go this way, ugh, watches will be unobtainable. It's it's a nut. Yeah. Anyway, carrying on through, I see a comment from from uh, annual calendar from from Kovacs. Yes, it looks like one. Friday eighteenth five. Is that, are there five quarters? I I do not know. This watch has all the funk though, Greg. Thank you for sending this in. We have uh, discussed this long enough. Crazy cool piece. It's a bubble, it'll burst. We're going to chat about that more later on. Right, George. This is this almost was a cover photo watch. I I adore this piece. Louis Erhard and the Alan Stilberstein collaboration piece. This being the day date model. Let's get another shot of it somewhere. He sent in a few. I love this. 
this was so close. Oops, this was so close to being the cover photo. And I did discuss this on the Watch Report Q2 Roundup. So I will put that link in the corner of the screen if you'd like to see. These collaboration watches, this whole idea of an artist getting involved in the design. This is so true to Bauhaus motifs, the colorway, so much to enjoy. Uh, this being one of the trilogy, this being the day date example, and you can tell by, this is a really cool feature, you have the date. The day goes from a smiley face to a grimace face, depending on how far down the week you go. So uh, by Saturday, it's a big smiling face, and then it slowly gets, you know, as you're going through the days, I love it. Um, it's, it's a really simple watch to understand as well, even though it's complicated. Seconds hand in yellow, uh, minute hand in blue, hour hand in red. Easy to break up the arrangement of the dial. The case looks stunning as well. The photograph is beautiful. I think there was a mention in the chat. And I've missed you again in the comments, as I normally do. Uh, let's see. Very fun, cool watch. Love the date emoji. It's cool, right? Yeah, I enjoy it. Andy's saying excellent photos. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, Eglantine and Francois, funny enough, I might be able to experience a solid gold 222 and bring it and review it on the channel in a couple of weeks, months. Um, a friend up the road from me has one and he is willing to share it. That'll be amazing because I think that the Vacheron 222 is it's so cool, it's so underrated. And a couple more shots of the watch in the display. This is from George again, if I didn't uh, mention you already, George. I love the way they've done the lugs. So I'm trying to remember the three models. They have a time only, they have a day date, and then they have a mono pusher chronograph, I believe. Yeah, lots of fun. What else can we say about it? Articulating end link. Uh, it's on this this nylon woven. It's got the Richard Meal strap going on, which is a love it or hated thing. So wearing it on the wrist as a little Velcro segment. What would we do in a world without Velcro? Huh? You know, it's one of those things. <laughs> you see the face changing over time. This must be like a Wednesday or something. Uh, I love it. It's so fun. It just, just adds a bit of character. Okay, carrying on. Yeah, Eglantine Francois. I might be very, very lucky. Um, a buddy of mine has just moved from London to the South Coast. So we're going to meet up very soon. And he is a watch collector and enthusiast. He's around my age too. So we can chat a lot about those specifics. He collects, his, his niche at the moment is small dress watches in in precious metals. So lots of annual calendars from, from Patek and um, AP, those kinds of examples. So it would be good to discuss. And of course, Royal Oaks and things. I might be lucky enough to get my hands on some vintage. He also he loves vintage stuff. So it'll be good fun. Thank you, NASA. <laughs> uh, Rubik's Cube. Yeah, yeah. Got to love Rubik's Cubes. Uh, yeah, lucky guy. Uh, you know, it happens. I was very lucky, though, to say the least. Um, yeah, carrying on. Watch collector moves out of London. He <laughs> gets to wear his watches. Shites on. Talk about yeah, the stigma going on around there. And is talking about the the gold being taken off the Rubik's cube. I don't know what's going on. Still, superb photograph. Got to thank you, George, for sharing these with us. Goodbyes in the small dress sector. I agree, Russell. I fully agree. In fact, one of the APs we're going to look at in a moment. Actually, it's one. It's coming up very soon. We've got a couple of Royal Oaks later on. George, thank you for this. We're jumping to James next. This is a stunning watch. Stunning, stunning watch. I mentioned in the beginning of the show that classic Rolex was all about that level of subtlety. This is an Oyster Perpetual reference 6084, and it's from the 1950s. This is the kind of watch that you would expect to be worn during the Everest ascent. Uh, it's a 34 millimeter watch, I believe. It's, it's solid gold. I mean, you, can't, you can never go wrong with a watch like this. I love it. It's just such a class act. Yeah. I wish we could still get Rolexes like these today. There's angular batons. There's just so much to take in and enjoy. Um, gold OP. Okay, that is nice. Yeah, condition is also stunning. Um, it's cool, right, Thomas? And the easy ways to determine if it's a watch from that time is basically the handset and the batons, very true to that era, as well as the way the minute track works around the dial. And the condition is also great. 34 mil. It's an Oyster Perpetual, which is quite something from back then because lots of them were, were hand-wound. And just take it all in. Drink it in. Beautiful example. One of the epitome watches of its time, I think, in that, in that way. Um, and it's just subtle. It's a solid gold watch, but still on a leather strap. Just works under the radar. Um, Pre-Explorer, right? Yeah, this, this pretty much was it. I would imagine 
this probably shares a similar reference to the the Hillary uh, Norgay Everest Expedition Watch. I mean, judging by the dial arrangement, they could have easily just transplanted it across. Who knows? Three, six, nine hands are loomed. Yes, they are. Be there, that's for sure. And there are there is loom around the batons on the outside too. Yeah, lots to enjoy. Stunning. Love vintage. Got to enjoy it. It's a distortion at the eleven. Distortion at the eleven o'clock. Yes, there is. Looking at how the crystal warps the the, the dial there, there's like a big yeah, funky, really crazy cool. Must be a, a dome crystal there. As an arrangement still superb okay i've got a lot still to go through so we're gonna we're gonna run through pre everything that's it hans pre everything um alex baldwin's watch really rizzab jones i don't know that uh okay carrying on that is rolex it's beautiful just beautiful typical of that era jump me to javier next he sent in a wide range of pieces and i think he might be in the chat i don't know <laughs> distortion turned up to 11 god uh, so we're chatting about another Explorer 2, another great example, another watch that is climbing in, in price today, unfortunately, because everyone wants one. And it's this whole dynamic of demand not being quelled. Will it ever be quelled? I don't believe so. Probably not Sapphire, Mason says. No, I agree. Um, and drilled lugs. Hold on a sec. Were they? Wow. I did not realize that. What a fantastic... Andy, thanks for that point. Drilled lugs on a 50s watch. I did not know they did that back then. Maybe it was done after the fact. I don't know. Good question to ask, though. Yeah, love it. Could chat about it for ages, but we've been running the show now for almost two hours, and we've got like a trillion posts to still go through. So, <laughs> yeah, watches are te terrible investments. I mean, there's, there's no knowing where they're going to go. So, chatting about this piece. Done enough of that in the past. Explorer 2, great example, good condition, case is nice and sharp, dial is clean. It's being the Swiss made. You know, must have been one of the last generations of the pieces. I don't know, difficult to cover. Taking a hit from the Tamnavulan. I'll be back with you in a sec. So Philip says that, that's an interesting point, the Aquaterra has more in common. Yes, very good point. The Aquaterra has more in common with this than uh, the current Rolex models. And isn't that crazy cool? Um, I love it. I mean, there's a reason why the Seamaster is my one of my darlings in the collection, is that the, the quarters, the, the way the dials arrange, the sharp batons just work so nicely. Speaks to the 50s. Um, everyone does not want one. I I am, hold on, I include everyone's, uh, sorry, Mason, I think it might be the coffee that's giving me a squint eye. Everyone does not want one. I am included in the everyone set i do not want an explorer 2 okay yeah i understand <laughs> eric eric with the time stamps uh geez probably 227 now final answer you guys are the worst okay yeah no i think we're doing pretty well we're gonna we're gonna meet our normal cutoff point at about 3 30 three and three and a half hours ish there about yeah, love the Explorer 2. I'd love to get one of these in to review one day. Hopefully, it would be nice to discuss because this makes a great, great everyday wearing piece. And again, I'll say that the white dial makes it sing. Okay, going to carry on some more funky examples. This, I believe, is an early 2000s Pepsi model, and they all went the same way with their bezels. The bezel, the red of the bezel went went gray. And it's, it's crazy. Hold on a second. No, hold on a second. We have no gold. This, uh oh 1675. This is not a 16750, I don't believe. It's an acrylic. Okay, so this is a 1675 then, I guess, looking at it now. It's a GMT Master. Maybe it's a 16750, the transitional. Mm. <laughs> Thanks, Alexander. Yeah, early 2000s. I misspoke. I looked at the bezel first and thought, you know, this, this comes from that era. I always, whenever I see them, I think they're early 2000s. It's from the 60s. Javier, thank you. So this is a 1675. It's not a transitional. Love it then. That's great. And the condition's pretty nice. Uh, the original bracelet looks to be on it too. Yeah, these watches are so hard to come across today. I'm wondering if it's had a replacement dial in its past. Tritium, yeah. I'm wondering if it has cheap ulcers. <laughs> uh, yeah, 1675. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. So Mason says, sorry, I am English, I promise you. <laughs> My giant sausage fingers seem to have a mind of their own. Don't worry. That's what it's like. It's, it's 10 to 12. So, I mean, in the UK, so, I mean, you know, you have nothing to, uh, to um, what am I trying to say? Nothing to...
recommend this coffee is obviously not doing the job um something turned to cry yeah the bezel the bezel is funky if this is the original bezel on the watch then it makes sense and very common faded bezel welcome james good to have you here sir um yeah cool looking piece nice arrangement and i think this is the only <laughs> more peruvian <laughs> that i'll definitely take you up on that million dollar bezel eric bleached that yeah bleached bezels it's a thing i think we might see more of them later on okay we're going to carry on javier we have a few more from you this is a nice one tantalum and steel this i believe is a 30 i'm going to say 34 millimeter royal oak uh that references the 4100 so the 4100 i believe i've handled one of these before maybe it was a 33 mil i can't remember but this is a this is a segment of the AP collecting space that I think a lot of people a lot of people should look into because they are relatively attainable. People aren't looking into them as much as they should, I believe. Especially a black dial with with two tone it looks stunning, really stunning. Notice how the date window has I don't know if it's faded over time or if that's how they were issued with the gold the gold bracket there. Yeah, it's stunning. AP at the top with running seconds, really clean nice example and we are going to look at an offshore in a second which james you've joined in at the right time uh you're going to have an enjoyment in a second and i'll try and read off this reference number which he mentioned in the email saying they should do something about their references uh tantalum yes eglantine and francois tantalum from back in the day a long time ago um and i think it is a slate gray yes it's a slate gray dial javier saying it's a 36 mil awesome lovely photo too and he says yeah it's it sums it covers the watch very nicely you get an idea of how the light would play on it and you can see the colors the contrasting colors okay i'm scrolling up in the chat to see what's going on i'm missing you all here time to get the cuban out step up the intensity shaitan says thank you for that thank you javier that offshore is my newest watch i am so happy well huge congratulations i am i'm loving there's a handful of offshores that do definitely grab my attention this one Let's chat about it for a second. So judging by the bezel, it looks like ceramic. Correct me if I'm wrong. Ceramic bezel, but then it has brushing to look like it's metal. So maybe it's titanium. Is it titanium and steel? This is the reference. This, this honestly makes like Seiko references and all the rest. Look for parking. <clears throat> Hold on. 26405CG.00, no, dot oo dot a 4 ca.01 hmm did you get that it's, it's important that you did um but there it is abdul's going to sleep thank you for being a part of the show you've been here for like two hours it's been awesome having you and uh, thank you for sharing your watches too it was great sharing them at the beginning of the show um andreas says doesn't look like a look at me watch at 36 yeah for sure that's the beauty ap's today very big bombastic these original pieces from like the 80s and the 90s they they sat under the radar very nicely there so this looks like navy blue contrasting with gray and we have i believed brushed titanium with ceramic pushes and steel i probably got that completely wrong there but that's just it what a reference number though fantastic looking ap james for anyone out there james loves his ap royal oak offshores and uh yeah not that's one of his if, if he had to choose any watch in the world to wear the ap offshore would win every single time so that's something and the movement is just as cool as you would expect it sounds like my voice is going maybe the peruvian is doing its job uh let's see take a hit from the whiskey why not and end of days i think we're talking about that reference number eric yeah i agree that was that was bizarre discussing that he did block out the reference number at the back for the security of the watch that's fully understandable these pieces are all pretty hard to come across today congratulations again i hear that offshores are virtually impossible to get in stores today hitting the uh, the whiskey it's so funny that five years ago i could walk off the street into an ap boutique and try on royal oaks offshores and all the rest it's one of the best experiences i've ever had actually the ap staff are leagues better than the rolex staff i've ever i've ever experienced i don't know about you 
but that's been my background. Fisherman's friend, not a bad idea, Evelyn Zine and Francois. I might do that. Watch by design. Since early 16750s had matte dials, only way to tell the difference between that and the 1675 GMT below the hour hand. Had a hand above the hour hand. I oh, see, they were stacked differently. Got it. The original Jumbo Royal Oaks remind me of the early 70s LP400 Kuntash. Ah, when it didn't come with big spoilers and extra flared arches. Yeah. And then the Kuntash just went next level. They went further and further. <laughs> uh, now I have the Royal Oak. Ho, ho, ho. Koji, I don't know if I, I missed you there with that comment, but anyway, I'll catch up. The one thing, one criticism I would make is the movement looks very small for this case. It is a 44 mil case, I believe. So that's something to pay attention to so awesome watch and another huge congratulations to javier for picking this piece up it's a stunning example and we were chatting about this arrangement earlier actually with zins and and all sorts so yeah got the coverage jumping to javier next we're carrying on with him with a sub date going back down to earth with hollow end links this must have been early 2000s uh, late 90s ish uh doesn't have a tritium dial, so yeah, you can judge around that error. I love the sub date. I love the sub in general. I so wish the five-digit references were easy enough to get your hands on today, but they are getting super pricey. And I've said this a couple of times before that these watches are getting molested in the in the category. That's going to get my page uh, flagged now. Um, the way these pieces are polished, it's insane. They are so overly polished a lot of the time. The 90s era variants... It's crazy. So if you can find one that's in good nick with, with chamfers on the edges still and the case is even, the lugs are even, you're very lucky. For some reason, these models in particular have been brutalized. <laughs> Hans, um, my first watch and my most, most prized watch, talking about the sub. Awesome, Javier. Is this, is, this is not a 16800. This is a 16610, I believe. Surely. Uh, the 16800s didn't have, oh God, I don't know. I can't, can't stand these references. Uh, yeah, Eric, so so for my birth year, it would be a 14060, no no M. Love it. Um, it really is a shame, the removal of metal. It is. Vincent couldn't have said it better. The fact that these watches have been polished to death. I mean, look at the way they've done the date with the serifs on there. It's just so charming. Okay, enough about Rolex. We've covered enough of them to the show. Uh, yeah, the one six one four zero six zero is a non date. So that's the one that I would um, that I would love. Uh, date date sub is also great as an everyday. I mean, these watches were like the charm back in the nineties and early two thousands. Okay, thank you, Javier. We're jumping to Jay next. Yes, thanks, thanks, for that James. One four zero six zero. This this that would be the reference for me for sure. Um, yeah, I'm gonna carry on through. Next up to Jay with. An SKX009. We haven't featured one of these for a while on the show. And what makes this one special, unique, rare and attractive, is that it's one of the last he saw listed on Amazon. Now, we know that these watches have been discontinued today. <clears throat> he paid $450 for this piece. And he agrees he overpaid for the watch, considering now that uh, they're, they're difficult to come across. How's that? The last of the SKX 009s, of course, it's in mint condition and everything, but he had to pay a, a pretty penny for it. And now that you can't get them, it's uh, it's a bit more difficult to source them. I think it was a shame that they got rid of the SKX. Something tells me that the way they've brought back the Seiko 5 in the modern catalog, this is just my thumb sucking. I don't know Seiko very well. The way they've integrated the Seiko 5s now, I believe that's like their way of replacing this piece, which is sad. Um, yeah. This SKX is just a, it's one of those pieces you can get in, enjoy, have fun. Uh, Non-M. Yeah, so Eric, my, my birth year uh, Rolex sub would be a non-M variant. Yeah, still great. 5513 Lollipop. Yeah, no date sub. I have fallen in love with James. You've always loved the no date sub. It's not, this is not a, an early, a recent thing. It's always been like one of the top watches in the collection. I mean, they're, they're superb. Okay, carry on. Not out. We're talking about cricket now, Hans. Um, paid 80 pounds for my orange dial. Yeah, it's just it's just nuts. So this this is my assumption that the Seiko 5 is supposedly taking the 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 what is it, the flame of this watch now to the new criteria. <clears throat> Congratulations on acquiring this SKX. Eglantine and Francois say <clears throat> the voice is going. Fisherman's friend to the rescue. Cherry flavor. Let's get it out. Now, if you have stayed for the show, you you're in for a treat now because we are looking at 
a amazing Cartier collection. Very seldom, it's, it's fun and interesting that there are a lot of Cartier only collectors out there. And Jonathan, by the looks of things, Jonathan M, by the looks of things, is one who solely collects Cartier. But we're not talking about just your average. These are all special editions. I think all of them are in platinum, which makes it even better. And they're all beautiful. They have their own charm. First off, tank. This is the Louis Cartier XL Paris. Awesome. Uh, in platinum. And he got it in 2006. Design dates to 1917. In his email to me, I mean, he really summed it up nicely. He said he loved the way that the, the page looks at the design of watches in a bit of a different way. And he wanted to share his love for design and the time periods when they were conceived. Now, I looked at this and just thought, ah, oh, it's just another Cartier tank, stainless steel. But suddenly when you hear it's platinum, you don't very seldom see pa uh, Paris on the dials. Uh, it hits differently. Also, notice how the dial's been done. So this is a rare piece, platinum variant. It looks very underrated, actually understated, considering that most tanks look the same today. I don't know the measurements. I think he might have given me the measurements of this model, but I saved it there. Yeah, timestamp, Al29 says. Let's have a look at the, at, it's been, it's literally hit the two hour mark. I think just over two hours and we're now transitioning into this. Five superb Cartiers in different levels of rarity. We will always have Paris. That's it. I suppose my birthday sub would be a 5513. Little chance of finding a good one these days. Isn't it sad, Mason? It is really, it's it's unfortunate. The vintage space especially, it's like, ugh, futures thinking. Thinking 10, 20, 30 years down the line, they're going to get more and more scarce. The question you have to ask is, will you ever get the chance of being able to get one for a decent price or, or not? Um, that's, that's insane. All the time, yeah, yeah. The all-time dress watch. This one is the icon, 1917. Bear that in mind because he's dated every single watch that he's going to be sharing. So this is beautiful. Next up, all right, another tank. This being a jump hour. How cool is this thing? I'm not even going to try to pronounce it. Just G U I C H E T S. Guichet. Guichet. I don't know. Can, uh, and Francois Negrantin, you know your, your French pretty well. Can you please uh, break down that word into its syllables? I can pronounce it better. Uh, in platinum, 1997. The design dates back to 1928. 1928. So we're talking 11 years later, this makes an appearance. Awesome. Um, James St. Cartier from Paris Boutique. Vintage watches are highly collectible. Oh, they are. I know. I've been very fortunate to handle some, James, um, in London. God, they're amazing. All, all the precious metals one, especially. The precious metals one. All the precious metal ones, especially, they um, highly sought off. I believe platinum is <clears throat> the most sought after. In the category just because how few they make um guiche thank you eglantine and francois junior johnson welcome i uh, gotta go need to say hello to my mom and stepdad oh, it's a pleasure absolute pleasure having you here thank you for for listening in to the show i don't know if any of it made sense but it's it's always a fun time just rattling on about these references um art deco to the max so this is a watch from 1928 yeah justin this is where the original design stems from back from then i'm going to zoom in a bit closer Look at the cobblechon on the crown and the typeface they used back then, open nine. Again, Junior, thank you. I didn't see you in the chat, but thank you so much for, for being a part of the show and listening in. Um, That's awesome. Really, really awesome. Shaitan, anyone who has a well-preserved SKX will be sitting on a nicely appreciated watch. Uh, we don't take care of things when we can easily replace them. Yeah, right. You're right. You're right. Thomas saying, got to love Cartier. Uh, round up the unusual Cartier as Koji. Yeah. So... Oh, my, one of my favorites we're going to look at in the moment, the, the Cintre. I absolutely love it. Yeah, it's going to be good. It's going to be stunning. So 1928, let that sink in for a second. Just so cool. Really out there. Again, platinum and from, what did I say, 2000, uh, 1997. Next up, the Tank Cintre in platinum again. And this one from 2000, and let me try and get a better framing of this for you. I'll tr it's a little bit offset. You're just going to have to bear with this. Um, it was from 2018. The design dates back to 1921, 1917, 1928, 1921. And this watch, did, did uh, Steve McQueen wear an American or did he wear a Cintre? I can't remember. I think it was the American that he wore in, um, oh, what's the film? What's the film? It's on the tip of my tongue. Someone mentioned it in the chat. It's a good little bit of a, 
a brain teaser. I love the elongated form of these cartiers that adds more presence to the wrist. It speaks of its era, the 1920s and the early 30s. Um, carrying on, shoot good stuff. Yeah. Uh, tonk, yeah, tanks and tray, stunning. I should say tonk sin tray, right? I shouldn't say tank, it's tonk, but yeah, I'm trying my utmost. Uh, it's mentioned in the chat about, about 5513s. James saying that 5513s are still obtainable and can be found, but not through traditional methods. That's it. You have to, <clears throat> and especially with vintage, the beginning of the show discussing this little, um, this little Smith's W10 I found, you have to know what you're looking for. Vintage is a minefield unless you do your studying. Going two hours into the show, go back to choosing your next watch. You have to study up on the watch that you're going after and make sure that it's authentic. Make sure you get shots of the movements. Make sure it's been serviced recently. All those little things factor into the price you're paying at the end of the day. Tungsten tray is stunning, though. I love it. Is this a ruby? I've, very, I've never noticed. Normally, it's a sapphire on the end. So this has to be a ruby to add that extra bit of punch. And the numerals are gorgeous. Uh, yeah, there are lots of piece uniques in this category today as well, but this is superb, sublime. Next up, très bien, love it. Carrying on to uh, Cartier Talk 2, Quantime Perpetual. Uh, probably butchered that one badly. Quantime is an amazing complication. Of course, this is from 2003, also a platinum case. The earliest Talk 2 case I've, been, I've seen documents back to 1912. Cartier, these are the ones to collect, ladies and gents. 1912, the wristwatch hadn't even made its debut officially, considering all things. And these things were breaking boundaries. Another Cartier Paris on the dial, seldom seen. Beautiful blued hands, great balance. This one is a bit busy for our liking, I would say. It doesn't, I mean, when you immediately look at it, it doesn't scream Cartier to us. A bit busy for me, Raw the Tiger says. That's good. Great minds. Um, Ruby, Ruby, Ruby. Um, another song reference there. Yeah, it is a bit heavy, got to say, with all the elements going on. We've got day, date, month, quarters, 24-hour um, time at the 6 o'clock, Cartier branding at the, t uh, it's at the 10. And then you have all the Romans around the dial. It's busy. But the Tortue shape, um, watch shape, Thomas. Yeah, Tortue shape is... Uh, you can see it really identifiable. That's the one thing you can easily notice when you're looking at these pieces. I love it. These these individual collections on a brand, so worth discussing and sharing. We have never sh this should have been shared last week with dress watches, uh, the Cartier series, beautiful. And carry carrying on. Where's NS something when you need him? Yeah, I agree. Right, you'll be able to sum this up perfectly. Uh, and carrying on in the chat and the Karen through here. So um, chatting about 5513s, um, Francois Neglantine said 5513 is the longest span of subs. So there are some available. Yeah, but I agree. Buyers have to do their research and homework. Yeah, very interesting watch, but I like it. Yeah, it's a funky beast. And last but not least, feels a bit Richard Mueller. Are we talking Frank Mueller or are we talking Richard Mueller? Interested in knowing Andreas. So Next up, this is also just a great example, the asymmetrique, which is clearly Cartier. Sadly, he doesn't have a crash. I think maybe Jonathan is on the hunt for a crash very soon. How's this? From 1996, also in platinum, design dates back to the 30s. So there we go. We've got five variations of Cartier from 19, what, 1912 to the 1930s, basically, and all of which made history highly sought after. And believe it or not, there are a lot of collectors today who would happily sell off their collections if they could get their hands on these kinds of models and solely collect Cartier. So that's something to pay attention to. They've got lots of value. These watches especially. I mean, these collector's editions in the precious metals, they'll always have value. Uh, these pieces at auction probably would go for a hell of a lot. And I think over time, they're going to be the same. Um, you can even notice the strap is skew. How, the, how did they even manage to do that? The scrap, the scrap, the scrap is oblong. Yeah, bizarre, bizarre. Love it, though. Um, I feel a bit Richard Mueller, as I missed it, yeah. Um, play that funky music, like that Hans. Perpetual calendar, awesome piece. Yeah, stunning. Really cool arrangements. Thank you so much, Jonathan, for sharing these with us. We've had quite the roundhouse selection of models. And there's so much more. I mean, this is just not even the tip of the iceberg. It is the tip of the iceberg, considering all the others, the Americans and uh, 
you know, we have the the roadsters and so many other examples. Yeah, Vacheron 1921 adjacent. Justin, good point there. Okay. So jumping back down to earth from Jonathan W this time, not Jonathan M, Jonathan W. We've got a Seamaster 300. Now, this is priorities right here. The camera focuses on the beer, not on the watch. The camera knows what, what it's doing. Um, I can't remember what he said in the caption. I think he was just enjoying this on the weekend. He was taking some time off. But you got to love, I'd like to know if it's an iPhone or a Samsung that did this. Have, it has its priorities. It knows what it's doing. The wrist shot is not, uh, it's not relevant in this conversation. So it's the way it is. And speaking of which, we're going to have a look at another Seamaster 300 in a moment. When I say a moment, probably in like a week at this flip and all, there's so much still to go through. What am I going to do? Uh, we've been running now for two hours, two hours, 10. Okay, we will do it. We will get there. John, thank you for sending this in. Uh, yeah, but beer rules, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, that's it. It takes the, takes the preference. And everyone's commenting on the great collection. i got to say again, Jonathan, it was so awesome seeing this stuff. It's so nice seeing a Cartier collection. Love to see more of it from people. Okay, so from, from the Seamaster 300 to a, another Prospex. John, thank you for this. Thanks for the beer. I think it's always good for a weekend. To Jonathan J. All right. So we got a Jonathan M, John W, John J. This being the, I'm taking a swing, SPB 151, known as the, at least I think that's the reference, known as the, um, the Willard, the modern interpretation of the Willard with the Prospects branding and all that stuff. These are great pieces. I think the design of this watch is stunning. Um, there's lots to enjoy about the turtle case. Funny factoid about this one is that it's 42 mils, where the original turtles were 44. Question is, do they need to sh shift the size down, or could they have left it at 44? They address lots of things well on this watch when you compare it to the original, but there are also some that I, I, I think were hit and miss. It's actually the, something I, I gripe that I've had with a few of the Prospects models, even the one that I have. Um, things like the framing of the date window. I so wish there was a little frame around it. Um, the hour and the minute hand, I wish they were the same thickness. The Seiko automatic should be one line of text, two lines of text. The Prospects, this, this heaviness underneath the dial, uh, not my jam. You see what I mean about pedantic? Yeah, modern will it. Thanks, that James. See what I mean about how pedantic I'm getting now with, with arrangements on dials. Um, just things like the fatness of the hour hand next to the minute hand. The typeface is just too heavy at the base. Seiko Automatic works a dream. But then you're talking about just over a thousand bucks you're spending on these pieces. The movement is a workhorse. 6R35, I can attest. Not the most accurate movement in the world, but it is a workhorse. You can really beat the snot out of it, and it's great. Uh, Thomas mentioning green dial looks awesome. Yeah, sure does. This is the standard black. I think the SPB 153 is the green dial, and this is the 151. I don't know. Seiko references will always uh, confuse me. I love the strap, though. Nice integration there. It's not as round. Very good point there, DK Hill. It's more oblong, hey, where the 44 mils had this like, hockey puck shape to them. Um, so Shantan says Seiko is coming out with a more expensive Captain Willard with a 44. Ah, and a 4 hertz movement. I hope that pays more tribute to the original. This is close, very close, but they could just you know, tighten it up in a few areas too. That damn X, yeah, the Prospects logo is a love it or hate it thing. I don't know why they're putting it on all their models, but yeah. Good thing it's not on the seconds hand. Imagine it on, as a counterbalance on the seconds hand. That would be a bit too kitsch for everyone out there. Okay, so we're going to carry, I wonder what the date should uh, have loom. That's not a bad idea. Yeah, loom patch. They did that with one of the latest new editions, the SPB146 or something. I don't know. Okay, going to carry on through to John M. Now, this is John without an H. So John J-O-N. See what I mean here? Jonathan M, Jonathan W, Jonathan J, Jonathan M. Yeah, so it, it doesn't it doesn't stop. Thank you for the Seiko, John J. To a lip 70s chronograph. He just picked this up recently. Now, John uh, John was the guy a couple of months back asking for a GMT chrono or something, I remember. And he, he ended up getting a Zin thanks to the recommendations on the, on the show. And this he just picked up. 
lip from the 1970s and he can't stop wearing it and it does speak like a 19 this is right up james and thomas's alley i think that's it got green dial orange accents 70s case you guys love it from that era it's using a Velju 7734 movement i think is that a Velju movement and that's all the spec that i saved from his description but he also had a shot of it in the light so you've got this cushion tv case style uh, typical like dashboard sub dials, which is cool. Pencil hands. You've got the, I think this might have been orange at one stage of its life, the second hand, but it's gone yellow. It actually reminds me of a Gorilla watch. You know, Gorilla watches as a brand. This one does speak to a date, red date window at the six. Looks great. The olive strap works perfectly on this too. Yeah, John, I can see why you like this piece. You have, you've paired it up nicely with this example. I'll leave this on the screen for a sec as i get back to the chat so uh mark's saying limited uh, limited ideas but the man in the street says james as soon as i can get a break from work okay missed missed that uh conversation nice lack of case finishing i'm serious right right no one's touched the case and this is the way it should be leave the scratches it tells a story it's part of its background cool looking piece james says love the lift brand traditional french watches yeah 1970s case and dial i'm in love yep that's a square case. How would you call the case design? Like block, block TV style cushion case. Yeah, it's cool. Congrats, John. You're normally in the chat. So uh, if you watch the show later, huge congrats on this piece. I can see why you like it. If you need a piece that sums up the 1970s, this next to the Yammer, um, what's that Yammer chronograph? I never get it right. Speed graph, not the Navi graph. I'll, whatever. Uh, the, the day of the dead one, the day of the dead graph. Um, this one definitely lines up with that nicely there. Okay, carrying on to Juan. Uh, let's have a look. Lip needs a supermodel with some innuendo. <laughs> for them. Okay, now Juan wanted to share some more shots of his oyster prints that he picked. Well, no, it's not an oyster print. It's a Rolex prints. It's a Cellini. Indoors, outside the boutique. Um, this one was featured last week during uh, the dress watch. Last month during the dress watch segment of the show. And one thing he mentioned to me that he likes is that the fact that it doesn't say Cellini anywhere on the dial, which is something that plagues a lot of these references today. Um, yeah, very 70s for sure. The bonus about this piece is it doesn't have any of those. It's plain, simple, clear. Going to take a hit of the whiskey for a sec. I think I need that in my system. Um, so we're ch chatting about the balance on the dial. You can see, I think we discussed this at length, talking about the arrangement of the one-third, the two-third setup with the quarter Arabics and the hand set and the I can this is steel, right? I don't think it's white gold. I can never remember. But he sent in two shots of this in and out. Normally Juan sends in a huge submission of pieces, but this week it's it's minimal. And I can see why he likes this. This is right up his alley when it comes to his vintage Hamiltons he collects and other pieces. Uh, Mason says, love the watch size vid this week. Thanks, man. Oh, absolute pleasure. Uh, I've, I've much preferred reading the comments than actually seeing the video. The comments are where the fun is, where the actual points are made, and some very good aspects and opinions around it, actually. Um, I'll try and get to a watch in a second that makes that, that fills into that criteria. Ooh, the big eye is coming up just now. Maybe we can feature it there. Just remind me, um, Mason, if you're still here in the next 10 slides, it won't, won't, won't be too long. I want to discuss that in more detail because there's lots to cover. That watch is a good example of that there. A wacky prince, <laughs> faux Egyptian. <laughs> yeah, it's a cool piece. It just speaks to the 1930s, and that's what makes it sing to him, especially. Uh, it's definitely an outlier, to say the least. I don't like the Cellini name. I wish the current Cellini Rolex was called the prince instead has a better ring to it, right? And Oyster Prince was always something that Tudor followed down the line. So surprised that they aren't doing the same thing with their models. Awesome, Mason. Please remind me of that question again. Um, what kind of whiskey, Dark Star is asking? It's a Tamavulan, and I think it's an eight-year-old. They don't, or it's 10, I can't remember. But it's a sherry cask finish. Anything with a sherry cask finish has my seal of approval. I love it. Um, it's a space side, I believe, as well. So it's sweet. There are lots of vanilla notes to it awesome juan and dunn aisle 29 one of the best comments of the show juan normally sends in 15 shots so we are juan and dunn today i love it i love it king midas yeah cellini prince okay going to carry on through to koji 
Koji sent in his reverso last week, I believe. And this is under UV light or black light. I don't know. But he sent in some funky, cool shots. So I thought we'd share. I believe this is the only reverso we're going to look at today. And I mean, you can never go wrong with the duo face. It's just charm. And how crazy that, that, that we just had a look at a, um, we've had a look at a gondola today as well as this. And now we're jumping to another. These are all 30s inspired cases, same as the Cartiers from back then. The Piano Man, yeah, that's it, right? And he is in the chat, so here we go. Snake, okay, another hit from the whiskey. Actually, no, I need more coffee in me. The whiskey can wait. Uh, having the same 369 typo as my beloved, yeah, Explorer, makes me love this piece. Love the Explorer. Uh, it's coming up just now, actually. There's a new old stock model that we're going to look at. My whiskey here is Jack Daniels Drowned in Coke. Oh, I haven't had Jack and Coke in years. I think since I was about 18. <laughs> That's that bad. I think that is bad. Beautiful duo face. So the back, what I like about this is that they are completely different sides, uh, of course. But I mean, we're looking at the back here. It looks modern and classical. Quarter Arabics, everything nicely arranged. Beautiful machine turning. And then we look to the front of it and we have the typical reverse arrangement. Looks like a lizard skin strap with it too. I mean, this is the Reverso in the purest sense. Absolutely. It's called the Grand Reverso, I believe. Grand Reverso duo face? I'll, I'll never remember. Um, Chaitan says, have you ever been kicked out of a guitar store for playing Stairway to Heaven? No, because I've never been foolish enough to do it, Chaitan. That's the secret. The second they start playing the A minor, that, that you, just, you just stop. You just grab the neck and say, no, stop it. There should be a rule, like a sign on the door. Oh, like, great point, though, Chaitan. Um, no. <laughs> Stay away to heaven. <laughs> uh, this is such a beautiful watch. I love it. Jagger Le Couture. And you see that Reverso text is there, nicely framed. Everything is rectangular. Isn't that cool? Subdial, the inner Giller shade, machine turned in component, and the outer element. Yeah, it's just great. I think everyone deserves a Reverso in their watch collection. Koji, it's always a pleasure. Um, you're in the chat still. A thousand dollar lizard shoes uh, flying on the door. Sorry, so flying on the door, I feel like my head is laying on the side of the table. Pound the drums. Pound the drums, your watch is coming up soon, <clears throat> in the next month or so when we get there. Yeah, so carrying on. Beautiful watch. It is absolute charm. And as far as a piano player's watch goes, this is the one, I think. In fact, <clears throat> the pianist, the film the pianist, he wore a reverso, I believe. Uh, Adrian Brody, was that his name? Yeah, there we go. So you heard it here first. The costume design department nailed it in that film. This is a pianist's watch right there. Rizab Jones says, if PRS Guitars was a watch brand, what would it be? Ooh, Paul Reed Smith. Mm. I'm going to think that through. Let's carry on next. Koji, thank you. We're jumping to Corey with another. This is cool. <clears throat> I want to chat about this for a moment. It's the reference SBGR. 261. Okay, so PRS, they are, you know, it's a, it's a brand that's been brought to the limelight. They have just pushed the boundaries in lots of areas. Everyone loves them. They're not old. They're pretty new. So in a watch space, oh, it's difficult because it's not, we're not talking high tier, like ultra craftsmanship. So, oh, Eric Bell, you've got to help me with that one. Maybe, maybe Eric and Hans and some other guys could help with that point. Uh, difficult. Uh, Chaz saying, thanks. Happy weekend for everyone. Yeah, you have to run. Awesome. Great having you here. You've been here for a while. So thanks, Chaz. Very good point, though. What do we call PRS guitars today? Micro brands. There's some great micro brand examples that we can maybe integrate. Hmm. Question. Very Patek the style. Okay, let's chat about it. So this he recently picked up. He This is actually the cornerstone of his collection at the moment. Hublot. Eric says, you know, that's not bad. That is not bad. Yeah. Design-wise, that, that falls in the same kind of category in ballpark. So uh, he picked this up quite recently and it's become the cornerstone watch of the collection. There was another example that he was contemplating, I think with the GMT. I can't remember. The, this was one of the last emails I saved, I think. And he decided he wanted the more simple arrangement. And this is Grand Seiko at its finest, apart from the Grand Seiko, Grand Seiko logo <laughs> arrangement. The cream dial is beautiful. The batons, automatic. Nothing superfluous on the dial at all. Case design is nice and sharp. It speaks to Grand Seiko, handset and everything there. Yeah. Vincent's asking about uh, how to send stuff in. Uh, in the description of the video, 
if you hit the show more button, my email should be there for you to, to follow if you'd like to send a watch in for the show next time around. And I think the heat blue, the second hand on this model, there's lots to enjoy. It's great size too. Yeah, this does speak to the origins of Grand Seiko, if I'm not mistaken, like the size and the case shape and all that. This is how they originally began. So beautiful. Again, Chaz, thanks for hopping in. It's just great. Um, Vincent says, just face palmed and I realized I should have checked the description first. No, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. You're not the only one. And funny enough, we've had a record this week of guys sending in emails without the pictures attached. <laughs> I think I had about four <laughs> this week. So if you're one of them, it's okay. It happens to all of us. You're, you're not left out. Um, Corey, thank you for this. Beautiful shot. Um, the Grand Seiko is fine. They should eliminate the Grand Seiko text, but the GS should be not, not the 12 o'clock should not be the 12 o'clock marker. Yeah, that's where, I, that's where I would love to place it just to see what it would look like. But interesting that you say that, Mason. There is something nice about how the quarters are shared between the 12, 6, and, and 9. And maybe the GS would break it up too much. It would look too... Actually, it would look very Gerard Perigo, wouldn't you say? The GP at the top. Okay, carry on. Beautiful example. I love the shot too. Huge congratulations on picking this, Corey. I think you just received this watch recently, so wear it in good health and, yeah, stunning example. Jumping to our man Chrono Craze next. He loves his vintage Seikos. Funny enough, we're jumping back to the 1970s to see these. This, to me, looks like a Pogue, but it's not the Pogue. It's the, it's the champagne dial. The reference is the 6139-6001. It's the speed timer, uh, silver dial. And what else do you say? The hero, I call it the hero shot. And he sent in quite a handful, so I thought I would share these. This is on a rally strap. This works perfectly with this piece, I think. Look at that case shape. Look how crazy weird. The It's like a bat wing, you know? So cool. So, so cool. Okay, getting into the chat. Uh, so Han's saying, did I, get, did I get your pick of the 5170? No, sadly, you didn't attach it, Hans. It's okay. Better luck next time. <laughs> Awesome case though, right? I believe this falls into the same category as the Pogue. Um, Thomas and James, you might need to help me out here because I'm not a, hold on, not resist, no notched silver Pogue. Eric, thank you. You know your Chronos, you know your vintage Seikos very well too. Hitting the coffee again. Come on, Pogue, let your body move to the music, Shaitan says. Yep, I love it. Pepsi, Pepsi bezel. The champagne dial is superb, and there's more shots on the wrist. I think it might be an Uncle Seiko bracelet that he's rocking. And another shot of the watch with the loom glowing. Yeah, 1970s charm. These watches you can still find today. So something worth paying attention to. Vintage Seiko, there are some in these categories that are worth love. And the next piece he sent into this and a bullhead that we're going to look at in a moment. Bullhead chrono is superb. Thought I own a snowflake. Eglantine and Francois say, um, talking about Snowflake Seiko, yeah, I mean, they're also doing leaps and bounds, the Birch edition and all that, uh, Irish Rover, Irish coffee, we're saying, I could just chuck the whiskey into this, it might be very nice, but I like the separate tastes, you know, I love this, all the dials in general, yeah, I agree, chai on. next up though, this is called the SCEB009, what an amazing looking watch, Bullhead chronograph with one of the most balanced dials I think I've ever seen on a Seiko before. This is crazy. I don't know the age of this piece at all, but look at that. That is superb. So you can see he does, he, I know uh, Chrono Craze does have an affinity for, and affinity for uh, these pieces. Actually has a Fume dial. How crazy is that? He loves these, these vintage examples. Bullhead Chrono, you either love it or hate it. This was something of the 70s that some believe were better left in the 70s, but there is some merit to them. And yeah, it works well here. Nicely balanced. And on a NATO strap, he sent me tons of photos. So I've had to like cherry pick six that work well. Love it. Really love it. 5170 preferred. <laughs> yeah, you saw the 5370 earlier, right, Hans? Yeah, we'll chat about that later on. Um, Forbin says the 6139 Seiko's non-fitted end lug approach lets the case shape show better. Are we talking about the integrated? It does look nice. It does look, and funny in the way it plays in the light, you would swear that this is a polished lug and it looks like this is open space. Yeah, I agree. 
And of course, these pieces all had these funky asymmetrical looking cases, right? They all angled upwards. That was a part of the, the charm to the bullhead chrono. UFO case, yeah, yeah. Uh, Thomas loves his bullheads, yeah. That's just the, the epitome, the epitome of the 1970s. Uh, pictures are just insane. Yeah, they are, they are. Doctor, doctor, please. Can I carry on through now from here? Uh, chrono Craze, thank you. We're doing pretty well time-wise. Two and a, how long have we been going for? Three, hold on. Two and a half hours, is that it? I think so, yeah. Two and a half hours, we're doing good. We might not meet the, the 2 a.m. deadline. <laughs> uh, great for togging. Dial appears illuminated, yeah, it's great. Really nice. Mini stopwatch on your wrist, that's it. The Fume dark blue rather than the grand faux dial, both are gorgeous. There is no bad choice. Awesome. Yeah, love it. Chrono Craze, thank you for sending these in. He has a YouTube channel, by the way. Chrono Craze, I'll type it in here. Let me see if I can. Uh, Chrono, I think that's how you spell it. Yeah, I think so. So he runs, last time I remember watching his channel, he has this segment called Watch You Strapping. And every week he shows off a watch that he's wearing currently. He has a broad collection of stuff. So check out his channel. I'll put his name in the in the comments for you to look at. All right. Thank you. Next, we're moving to Mark. And Mark is rocking a Helios C4 bronze. Mark has reached out to me with a very interesting proposal. He's currently away. I'll keep the surprise for later. Um, for later on, if the, if the when or if the watch arrives, and we can chat about it in more detail. But um, a gent of a guy he reached out to me on Instagram, and he has been watching a lot of these shows in the past. So we're chatting about um, Helios, a brand that's transitioned out of the micro brand space. I believe it's. I'm sure a couple in the chat would agree. It's it's transitioned out there, and it's now very well known. They're doing some great stuff. I mean, they they pioneered the Tiffany blue dial on their watches before Rolex did with their um, models. Uh, as far as micro brands go, they offer a lot in these categories. So here we have a sunburst emerald green on a bronze case, and it looks out of this world fantastic. That's this is the this is the colorway. This is how color should work. You know, emerald on gold always works, no matter what. A stunning arrangement. Uh, you've got a triangle at the 12 that's vertical, which is something different. Uh, just a simple, basic, everyday going piece, automatic. So no Swiss made, none of that. Sorry about the screen glitch. I think it runs a Miyota, Miyota based movement. Um, <laughs> Helios sounds like when you have bad breath. Halitosis, right? That's that's the term, I think. Right? <laughs> bad breath. Another Greek micro brand. Yeah, yeah, that's it. That is it. Uh, halitosis. Yeah, it's pretty good. The whiskey is working. So is the coffee. Thank you for this, Mark. <laughs> Helios. Okay, I'm going to carry on through. Next, we're jumping to one of my favorite watches. It's because I own one, so I'm biased. This was one of the content photos for this week, or the, the community posts. And it is the Longines, Ava oh, oh, the Longines Avigation Big Eye on a Phoenix NATO strap. Right. Mason asked me a question about watch size and presence and preference and everything there. Well, maybe I am biased, but this one, it's 41 millimeters exactly. Uh, and the dial is spot on. Just the handset they've used. It's, <clears throat> it's rhodium plated. Well, no, it's not. Is it? I don't know. It's not. It's a non-polished rhodium plating on the hands. So you would swear they're white painted, but they work in every light. There's great contrast on the dial. There's typeface. Nothing superfluous on the dial, too, you notice. The original actually had less text. The original just said Longines because it's based on a prototype. Yes, I have a review video that I've been working on for ages, getting it prepared. Uh, the recording's all done. It's now just taking the photography and sitting down and getting some footage to, uh, together, which is going to happen eventually. The review will happen. But this watch is so much to enjoy. And for value for money... Ladies and gentlemen, do yourselves a favor and get one of these. Whether this example or the new titanium model, you'll not be disappointed. ETA-based, column wheel chronograph, automatic movement. Yeah, it's the field watch on steroids. It's beautiful. <laughs> Hans, no, it's not a Bark and Jack NATO. It's, it's Phoenix. So it's the original um, tight weave, tight weave Phoenix NATO that we love. So chatting about presence and dials and all of that, yeah, comparable with the Zinn. Weight and clarity. What movement? Hans, I believe it's an ETA-based movement, but made specifically, I think it's based on a Velju. 
I don't know, but it's made specifically for this model back in the day. That's the story behind it. Um, Pahonix, that's a Chiton, thanks. Um, so the big eye, it's it's a funky, funky machine. Here's another shot on a distressed leather. Talking about size and proportion and everything else. This watch is 41 mils in diameter and it's got like a 49 mil lug to lug. It's so, it's so good. It's spot on good. The proportions they nailed. Case height is 14-ish millimeters, including the, the box crystal. The big eye aesthetic is nice. One thing I will add that just struck me the other day, I've been wearing mine quite a lot during the summer on a rally strap, is regardless of where the hands are on the dial, you can just love it. There, there's, there's very few watches out there that, that grab your attention regardless of where the hands are placed. You know, sometimes it's like five, or say 535. It doesn't look very good. On this piece, there's so much to drink in. So yeah, I could gush about this watch for ages. I, I love it. I'm uh, basically giving you the hard sell <laughs> on, this, on this example. Uh, yes, and Eric's saying the puss is gray. That's it. The puss is gray. Admiralty strap. We've said all things today. Hey, hookers and prostitutes and yeah, that's how we do it. It's awesome. Uh, there's just so much. I, it's very hard for me to fault this watch. If anything, I would fault the thickness. It could be thinner, but then it has all the componentry inside it that makes it automatic and all those facts. So yeah, it's it's fun and it's got history and yeah so thanks for that martin you've just uh, brought my uh, <laughs> brought my attention back in isn't that a rank in the navy i believe it is hans um carrying on through so this is from martin c jumping to martin g now and it's the old faithful 39 millimeter explorer with a sticker on the side of the case and the story behind this is that you know, these watches are discontinued now I believe this is the only Explorer one we are seeing on the show. That's it. So by a person, that's it. So Eric's mentioning the watch, the, the strap, this, I'll go back up. The Phoenix NATO was supplied by the purser at stores department. So that was obviously a bastardization by the guys there and they called it the pusses strap. So that's <laughs> pretty, as you would expect, you know, military and their, and their one liners. So this watch still has its uh, sticker on the side of the case. He bought this, Brand new, not from an AD, I don't believe. He bought it on the gray market for an inflated price, but he's wanted this watch for a long time, and he's extremely happy to have it. Uh, don't you like them in 36, James says? I do. I do, James. Welcome. Great to have you back again, James. I do like them in 36. Um, yeah, we, we know my gripes. I mean, I had a, a freaking mental breakdown with the 39 mil. I don't know if I want to relive that again. It's just something about proportions, and for, for a bigger wrist, I can understand this watch works perfectly. I mean, he this looks like a similar wrist to mine. Um, there's lots to enjoy here. As far as a one and done piece, I think a lot of us in the chat, Hans is probably wearing his right now. Uh, that's it. The three six nine er. That's it. Um, there's lots to talk about. But then again, it's also a watch that people yawn at when they look at. So, yeah, both sides of the fence. One thing I'm enjoying about the idea of owning a 36 mil Explorer is that level of subtlety. I've got the 41 mil Longines. I've got a 40 mil Omega. Rolex, I believe, the traditional Rolex in the smaller sizes, that, that subtlety that they had once back then has been lost with a lot of modern examples. And in the professional category especially, this has been the smallest professional watch that they've ever had you know, in the modern sphere. And now they've just made it even smaller. So yeah, so lots to <laughs> lots to cover. Carl, welcome to the show. Um, I haven't missed you here. It's a beautiful looking watch. It is. It is. The Explorer is a stunning machine. No ifs buts. Uh, yeah, you can just just drink it in. It's it's a classic. It always will be a classic. That typography, the arrangement of the triangle at the twelve, the, it's just so recognizable. Even though it's a watch which <laughs> was based mainly on promotional and advertising information, not so much historical relevance because the real Explorer watch didn't have any of this stuff, but the I, I love the developmental history behind this piece, especially. Yeah, and we're talking about Hans wanting to sell off his collection just to own this piece, just to keep this one in. That's a worthy point to cover. Yeah, love it. So next up, Martin, thank you for sharing this in. Uh, huge congratulations again. Uh, with the sticker on the side, I hope you wear it in good health and just just rock it, man. That's all you need. Just as far as Rolex goes, yes, you can get a sub, but then the Explorer is also just one of those under the radar pieces out there. Love the low profile. 
under radar this as Hans just mentioned. Next, we're jumping to Mike. And Mike just picked up a big hitter in the Tudor character family. And that is the ceramic Black Bay new watch alert. Black Bay master chronometer. The great potential of the Tudor Black Bay. Talk about shameless plug. It'll be in the corner of the screen for you to look at. My throat is starting to hurt. So we're going to go with water this time around. Be the, be the water drinker. John is in the chat. Welcome. We were discussing your pieces earlier on. It was really cool. Oh, your, your 70s lip chrono, right? Speaking of under the radar. Yeah. So chat about this for a second. Okay. Thank you for the super chat, John. He said, question about Bakelite bezels. I'm looking at a few 70s divers with Bakelite bezels. How worried should I be about Bakelite cracking? Surprisingly... Uh, they actually do last. They actually do work very well. The the beauty about Bakelites, I believe, what I've studied in the past, is that one of their primary um, utilities is that they can take uh, the abuse from outside elements pretty well, all things considered. Of course, there are some stories where Bakelite cracks. That could do with the purity of the material itself. I think the the beauty about Bakelite is that it is UV resistant. I don't know if it's A or B resistant, but it is pretty good. And from the 1970s, I know a lot of skin divers used Bakelite back in the day. So uh, yeah, go for it. It's it's all, I mean, again, remember, you're dealing with a vintage watch. So you're not going to take this thing mountain climbing or diving or smash it against a wall. You are going to treat it with respect. And just as long as you do that, and the, be the bezel itself doesn't look like it has any cracks on it, it looks fully formed, then you're in good shape. Not bad. I'd like to hear other people's opinions on this point. Uh, thank you for that, John. I hope I answered something, <laughs> something there. Uh, okay, carrying on, carrying on. Rolex made the gray market, SRC. So we're talking about the um, master chronometer. I love the potential of this watch. That was the whole point of the video that I did on it. Uh, they, they, they are making ceramic more egalitarian. They're making it more mainstream, more affordable for people to pick up, which is a great thing. I've often questioned why there aren't ceramic watches on the market for good prices. And this came around basically half the price of your standard ceramic variants. It's a win. Also has cool like little touches to it. The fact that it's a sunburst dial. It's not a flat dial. The fact that it's meta certified. Um, lots to enjoy. The one downside we could say is that the bezel, difficult to read in certain lights because it's not loomed in any way. But then again, full ceramic. You can enjoy all the quirks. And it is a black bay. It's the blackest black bay. The last one they did, I think, for only watch had blacked out numerals or blacked out batons and hands and everything. This is the legible blackout black bay. So, yeah. Coffee is doing its job. It's obviously doing its job. Huge congrats, Mike, for this piece. Um, hitting coffee again. Um, I have a Bakelite box for my Navi timer. They stopped doing them about 10, 10 years ago. Bakelite's a good material. Downside is that it's extremely, it's very expensive and requires, just from a manufacturing stance, requires a lot more processes before it gets to the final result and it is expensive next to the more mainstream plastic molds and ceramics and things. Beauty with Bakelite and acrylic bezels we're seeing a lot of um, with the sapphire capping on, on dive washes and stuff is that you can put loom underneath them so you can get some nice flair with that. Carrying on, Mike, thank you for this. Love sharing the ceramic. This was the community post for the show. To Null next, and I really like this. I think I've worn this exact watch with a gray dial in the past. So this is a reference 14790. I believe it's 33 mils, 34 mils, 36 mils. Ah, who cares? This is, again, an undersized Royal Oak, I believe, and it is awesomely cool. It's so nice. And the, the yellow gold, surprisingly, the, the one I wore, it didn't feel heavy in the slightest, actually. It, was, it still felt extremely light, which is, which is crazy. Smells awful on fire, Eric <laughs> says. Uh, so Vincent says, I believe Bakelite was used in some typewriters. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the, Bakelite is the precursor to plastic. I did a video about, about that stuff. Um, just Google search, uh, I don't know, ID guy, watch bezels. I discuss all the variations and the pros and cons of each. Um, Bakelite was an amazing material of its age. Typewriters, toasters, you know, when we hit that Art Deco period. So uh, they were used everywhere. Amazing stuff. Look at that bracelet. Gorgeous about the finishing. Yeah, I mean, that's it. 
I do love these undersized Royal Oaks. I don't know if I'd be able to wear it on a daily basis, but there's something nice about them. And I mean, this is where you have to be looking today since the modern stuff is, yeah, you'd be more lucky to find, I don't know, money on the ground than one of these available. The date wheel matches the, yeah, that's it, right? So that was from Mr. Cassio Oak. Welcome. Date wheel matches the dial. It's stunning. It's just superb. What else do we need to say about the Royal Oak? Gushing about it all the time. Uh, the case, that, I mean, everything's in such good nick. This looks new old stock virtually. The bracelet doesn't look like it's ever been touched. And it's the way to collect them. It really is the way to collect them. So carrying on in the chat, I've missed a lot of you here chatting more about Bakelite. Uh, Forbin saying Bakelite lasts for many decades and was used to resist heat on pot and pan handles. Yes, some from the 20s, no cracks. Oh, you have some. Wow, cool. Yeah, that's it. That's it. Carrying on. Was Bakelite cellulose based? I'd like to know that. I believe there was a plant, plant related. Hmm. Trying to remember my history three hours into a live show. Carrying on through. Noel, thank you for this. Next to Neferion. I love this. Uh, Neferion, I made you look even cooler by blacking out your eyes. I've redacted this, uh, this picture. You went. So this is the Steel Dive Flieger. Very fitting watch for this occasion. Looks like a biplane you were in. And my dad, classic biplane, you went out for a trip the one day. Yeah, it's just awesome. Just so cool. I would love to get into a biplane and experience it. There's lots. I mean, I'm quite fortunate where I'm based on the South Coast. I believe there's an airstrip very close by. And uh, they fly you know, original hurricanes and um, spitfires very often and lots of observational biplanes around where I live. So you just hear the chugga, 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 chugga in the sky when you're outside and you, you see these things. Also Chinooks, surprisingly. Chinook helicopters just cruising over. I don't know I don't know where the hell I am <laughs> after time, but it's cool to see this stuff, you know? Uh, Flieger Friday has to have been. I hope it was. Um, Fliegers are awesome. This being a type A dial, if I zoom in, since we are here for the watches, type A dial arrangement, it's a gem sterile as fliegers should be the crown should be an onion or a diamond this looks like maybe an onion or a generic i don't know handset looks like something you'd see from an iwc not actually no pretty close to what you would expect from that time period as well and in a biplane i mean technically uh, we're talking about different time periods but yeah pilot watch in a plane i'm a chicken hon says I think the alcohol has well and truly hit you there. So uh, watch by design. I restore vintage Bakelite horn swatch. Oh, that's it. Switches from British cars, mostly uh, Heelys from the 50s and 67. Uh, Bakelite can be brittle, so it can crack chip easily. That is the biggest downside, yeah. The brittleness, I mean, it can break in your hands if you're not careful. I'm a schnook. That's it, Hans. Schnook, the, the double-bladed helicopter gadget. Uh, Where's the branding? Vincent, a lot of these watches, or we're talking about a traditional Flieger, it shouldn't have one. Normally, I think Steel Dive, they might have a branding here. Um, but branding on watches, on these watches especially, never really happened. The authentic ones don't have any branding on them whatsoever, um, the typical way. And funny enough, Neferon, you're going to jump next to Nico, Nico G. I don't know why he gave your surname, but anyway. Um, we're going to look at a couple of very peculiar examples here. And we're actually coming to a close for the show. How's that? Three hours in, almost. Two hours, 50 minutes, actually keeping up with our timing for a change. Uh, V22 Ospreys that fly over San Diego. Yeah, yeah. Uh, got, you got the watch smile. <laughs> uh, yes, so lots of brands do, in fact. We can chat about Fliegers in a second. Um, so next, we're jumping to a mule diver. At least I... I it is a yeah, it is mule. I've never seen, we have featured a brand like this before in the past, but I have never covered it in, in depth. So Neferon, thank you for sharing this. I don't know if I've seen you in the chat today. Urin Sun, that's you. Fantastic. So Glasruta, we've got it all. Mule diver. At least I think it's a diver. It does look like one. Love the loom. Awesome photography. It looks like uh, BGW9. Just superb. Nice arrangement. And Glasruta and their watchmaking, they just, Win it. It's just strides. They're doing so well with what they do. Hitting the uh, Tamnavulin again. I'll be with you in a moment. Stova. So, talking about unbranded dials from Vincent. Stova makes unbranded. Laco. Um, another great brand that you should be looking into is Decla. Decla watches. 
they are probably one of the best in this category actually um all the stuff they make is in house a lot of a lot of Flieger league brands tend to outsource their manufacturing declo is one that does it all in their own foundry everything from forging their own metal cases to heat bluing their hands and yeah i might be discussing that very soon one of these days bezel turns in both directions not a true diver ah so not a true ISO certified. Ah, that's great though. Also noticed that it has double dots at the 12. So that's very typical of, you know, the aviation pieces of the time. I love it. I mean, the Glossuta, I love that type the base. And it seems like a lot of German brands tend to flare their uh, their descriptions at the top. Yeah, it's cool. 30, oh, 30 atmospheres, really? This is a 30 atmosphere resistant? Hold on, hold on. So 30 means... 30 means uh, 3,000. Oh, uh, Eric, help me out here. 3,000 meters then? Is that the case? No? Three, yeah, it is. It's 3,000 because three is 30. Three, I don't know. What am I smoking? Anyway, you get the idea. Stunning looking watch. Great example. Ceramic bezel, I believe. And he sent in another shot of a 300 meters. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Warren Sun. I can't do maths. Uh, jumping to a Dornbluth. Now, this is cool. This is really nice. Donbluth and Sun. I hope I got the name right. So heat blued hands, all all the things you would expect. White dial. I think it's a sterling silver dial. Lots to enjoy. More specifically, Eric says two ninety. Thank you for that, Eric. That helps. Um, <laughs> old Spice <laughs> Hans. Yeah, that, that's it, right? That is it. I think this is a sterling silver dial, judging by the finish and the printing's all nicely done. I, these might also be in-house made for what I know. Everything from the heat bluing of the hands. They've even bent the minute hand, which is amazing. Uh, this would fall under the category of being an observer's watch, like a marine chronometer inspired piece. And look at it. Just covers it all in good detail. Uh, nice case. I like, yeah, interesting. Andy asking the, the case diameter. I would take a guess that it's 38 mils. 38 mils on the nose, maybe 39. Uh, white dials always make things look bigger, as most of us know, but still charming, stunning example. And if Francois and Eglantine are still watching, if you're based in, in Paris or France, it is, what, 10 to 2 in the morning. So I don't know if you're still watching, but we're going to chat about the Bond Seamaster now, and that's going to be good. Uh, Still, I love it. This is so, what I like about these two examples from, from Urenson is that these are two typical German inspired examples here of these pieces. Um, they feel right at home. Dornbluth, a company of just nine people making over 180 watches per year. Mm, special. Love it. So clean. Uh, yeah, Eric's now getting deep in with the depth, saying 290 meters as we are at one atmosphere, 10 meters at sea level. The, the pedantic contest winner. Yeah, that's okay. It's okay, Eric. I mean, this, you've been in the water more than on land in your life. So, I mean, it's important. Uh, duty calls. Many of you say. Okay, we're going to carry on through. So, Nico, thank you for sending these beautiful pieces. We're going to jump to the Bond. <clears throat> I've called it the Bond Seamaster. I don't know what, what the name would be. And the more I look at it, the more I think this is going to be a quite a classic piece, all things considered. So, it's, it's great. Two titanium, grade, grade five titanium case, grade two titanium bracelets. I think I'll never, I'll never get that right. The faux patina, love it or hate it. Yeah, it adds a nice bit of contrast to the dial, a nice colorway, and it allows for you to pair it up with some great straps. This is on Erica's original strap. Awesome shots by by Onar. I think you were in the chat earlier today. Uh, lots of things to take in. I mean, it's the the downsides with the professional. They are things that haven't been removed here with this example. So you either like them or you don't. This is most definitely a part of Omega's flair and their DNA now. So that's just the way it is. I also enjoy the little things like they have added the MOD triangle at the base. And you know, only technically it should be used on. And I can show you this officially. Let's go all the way back up. Uh, it should be used officially on the real deal mod issued pieces but there we go i mean that's just that's just how it is uh so in a way they're trying to sell that idea that it's an mod spec example which is quite cool it also has six lines of text which is uh, eh, at least it's balanced out um also like the fact that they've brushed the hands on these pieces too often do we see omegas with highly polished hands um and i'm going to get into the chat now because i've missed a couple of you look at that shot so cool. The texture on the dial is stunning as well. Yeah, I like it a lot. And 
Let me zoom down and catch up with the chat again. So, uh, patina works with the colors. It does, BDEV. I agree. And especially with the strap. Very complimentary. Um, Sam, good morning. Wow, I think I'm late to the party. It's okay. Uh, we've just we've just crossed the 1 a.m. barrier in the UK. In parts of Europe, it's even later. So, welcome to the show. Um, <laughs> why would a... Yeah, that's a, Rick. I mean, why would, <laughs> why would a spy have a watch with an MOD insignia. Hmm. Very good point. That just sums it up entirely. Yeah. Generally, spies would go with watches that are completely unbranded with no ties to any watchmaker, which is something to consider, especially when you're being interrogated. You don't want to know that there's any tie to a certain brand. And unfortunately, the MOD hallmark now is, <laughs> is something that ties ex directly to <laughs> UK government. So it's quite, it's quite a bad thing to have. That's a very good point. No, you should mention that. That was Rick. That was fantastic. Very good point there. Uh, some things will never change. Nice dial distortion. Yeah. Uh, what if Fotina ironically brightens to white after 100 years? Vincent, you never know. Imagine that. The Fotina actually, <laughs> actually looks more modern over time. That's the question we have to ask. How will these watches age? Like when, when water gets into these cases, what's going to happen to this contemporary modern loom? If it's going to alter the finish, if it's going to make it darker. The idea behind this watch, I believe, is that they've left it all aluminium. I think this is actually an alum aluminium dial as well as an anodized aluminium bezel. Aluminum to my American friends. So that means then that when the sun does play with these, it will brighten the components. Uh, the gray will you know go more like a dove gray over time i don't know i really don't know it's all down to personal preference uh sp spy wouldn't wear a nine thousand dollar watch either that's it right <laughs> oh you guys are poking holes into our dreams and imaginations here look at that loom it's almost it's uh oh come back it's so good it's almost overkill eh? i love it I love it. I mean, I think the standard professionals should all have loomed bezels. It's just, that's what you want to see on a dive watch. Uh, aluminium siding. Yep, that's it. <laughs> we can have a debate on aluminum versus aluminium. Uh, I mean, it has, and if you if you break up what the word, how, how the word is, is spelt and it's written out, I don't even know if the American uh, typing is different with the word. I'd like to know. Uh, better get my coat. <laughs> it says... Uh, a spy should wear a Casio. Yeah, F F ninety one W is probably the best spy watch there is out there. Um, every link on the bracelet should be loomed. I love it, Vincent. You've been on fire today. Thanks for being a part of the show. I loved your one liners. They've been great. Uh, yeah, lots to enjoy about this piece. I think there's when it comes to detail and things that you can drink in on this model. They are, f especially in the professional mod category, there are few that do it better than this. Uh, you can just enjoy the fully graduated bezel. The way the dial has texture to it, the handset is nice. It all works. Um, I must say, uh, speaking of the MOD specification and all of that, I think as far as professional Seamasters go, I like everything about this watch. Even with the helium escape crown and all of that stuff, it works. And no date exactly, Andy. There's no date on it either. So nothing superfluous really. And some great nods and callbacks. I mean, if you look to the case back, it has all the, the original MOD insignia about the issue number and all that stuff. So I think they made like their own NATO stocking number for the watch. I don't know. Cyanide capsule. Yeah, you've got to have one in the back. That's, a, that's exactly what this crown system should be. Maybe that'll be in the next Bond film. How cool would that be? Instead of uh, having a bomb in the thing, it's a little cyanide capsule. Can... <laughs> I mean, that's if you talk about discretion, it's the kind of thing you would expect on a spy watch, especially MOD assigned. Hmm. Love the comments. I do like the watch. Wise cracks aside. Yeah, it is, it is cool. Uh, motorhead overkill every link. Killed by death. Yeah, killed dead, right? Oh, no, thank you for sending this in. Honestly, it's, uh, it's great to share. I love the khaki finishes, and there's lots I enjoy about it. Um, please stop before I buy one. <laughs> Bond needs GMT. He does, right? And I think he did wear a GMT at one stage. I don't know. I don't freaking know. Right. And the loom is just insanely good. I mean, I might, if given the opportunity, I might consider getting one of these actually because I have the old. I have the original and now I have the new. And I'm always a fan of anything MOD. I'm a sucker for it. So, yeah, I might be selling it to myself. At least it doesn't have 007 or James Bond written on it. Exactly right. I mean, a big fat 007 in the center of the dial, because that's what you want. That's what's going to make it timeless. Huge, 
<laughs> or a James Bond crest on the left-hand side. Oh, talk about kitsch. Carrying on. Okay, moving to Pim next. Thank you for these, Ona. And he just picked this to watch up. This is the new, it looks like Hesolite. Once again, looks like Hesolite. And this is the new 3861 caliber. I think most who have been watching the show, like Mark earlier on, I think he's probably fallen to sleep by now. It's like Saturday evening, mm -hmm. so I would expect. Fallen to sleep. More whiskey needed. Fallen to sleep. So <clears throat> has the new the Jubilee-esque articulating bracelets with the sharp edges. edges, edges, edges. He mentions things like the finishing is not as, he, wish, he wishes it was a little bit softer. That seems to be the commentary on a lot of these new models is the bracelet, as great as it is, flexible and well-fitting, it has caught hairs, he mentions. It catches his, his hairs on his arm, as well as the underside being a bit sharp for what it is. So that's it. Edwin, welcome from Amsterdam. Good morning. Goodness gracious. It's like it's two in the morning where you are, right? Welcome to the show. Better late than never. <laughs> Hope you're well. Um, what about Vostok watches, Radu asking? We featured a couple of them in the past. I don't think we have any on this show, but we do often discuss them here. Uh, yeah, the whiskey and the coffee work are working well, Edwin. I think that's why I sound like I'm having fun. Here's a light. There was mention about a halo. Um, the aura is nice, Justin says. Yep. <laughs> and Harry's saying that, that 007 on a second-hand counterweight. God, appalling, appalling. We were just chatting about the um, this example, this MOD variant. Looks great. Okay, beautiful speedy chatted about them so many times now and it's a great pickup congrats on getting one of these pieces um there's lots to discuss and talking about accuracy it's one thing that i need to just cover and emphasize again these coaxials are no joke it's, it's insane how good they are actually you know mine is running on the nose for the past seven days i've been wearing it constantly hasn't hasn't changed these two between plus two, minus two, they sit right in that ballpark. Even over the course of like three months, they can be running two seconds fast. And it's amazing what Omega is doing with their watchmaking. I believe that when we look at the difference, look at this guy dropping knowledge at like three hours into the show. Com between Rolex and Omega, Rolex, I think, are watch manufacturers, where I think Omega are still more watchmakers. They take great pride in how they continually evolve their movements and what they do in the in the categories which i really admire so when you're buying omega you're buying watchmaking in in excess which is beautiful cigarettes whiskey and wild wild woman thank you for that hans carrying on through to pound the drums uh he just sent this thin pim thanks for this uh he just picked this up recently new watch alert again from the ad i believe tudor black bay navy blue it is a stunning stunning watch Good fun to wear, easy to rock on a daily basis. And if you want to add a blue watch into your collection, there are few that I think tip the barrier at this point. Another thing that blew me away about this watch when I experienced it over like two months is the accuracy is insane. The movements that they're putting in these pieces are superb. So another thing you should pay attention to, if you want an accurate watch, these in-house Tudor movements are stunning. Andy, got to go. Pleasure having you here. Thank you. I mean, you've been here for like three hours. Thank you for joining in and listening in. I, I do have a tendency to put people to sleep, so it's a beautiful thing. Uh, Chris D is saying, my coaxial planet ocean is plus naught seconds a day. Yeah, over the past 22 days, it's unreal. It is crazy. It is actually, it's something that, that I don't think the brand gets enough uh, kudos for is the accuracy of their movements. <laughs> it's crazy good. Meta certification, uh, master coaxial, uh, no jokes. Right. So carrying on to this piece, uh, talking about the MN reissue. Hey, another shameless plug. I'll put it in the corner of the screen. Um, French Navy. It's going to be happening in September, I believe. We're going to see this watch either looking like this with a MN insignia on the case back or uh, you know, a complete overhaul with a snowflake dial, which I believe is going to be, you know, I don't believe that's going to be the case. But you know what? It's nice to dream. It's nice to have high hopes and have them crushed when the day happens, when there's an unveiling. So <laughs> that's it. Uh, beautiful. Black Bay 58, they nailed proportions on this watch. The color is also stunning. He's captured this well. There's a shot of this watch on my Instagram where I try to get it in like three different lighting scenarios at once. It's a beautiful blue. I think photos just don't do it justice, actually. So yeah, huge congrats, Pound the Drums. Thank you for sending this in. You were in the chat earlier. 
Tiberius asking, where is the Vostok? <laughs> Again, I don't think there's a Vostok on the show, uh, as far as I know. We normally do have them. They, they do rock around. Love it. Gain two seconds in two weeks. I mean, how's that? Upon the drums. You hear it. You heard it here first. Uh, EP Life. Well said. I don't know who it's talking to me or someone in the chat. All good. Um, and carrying on through. Kluski. I think I was from, from Hans again. Carrying on to Raymond. Raymond was in the chat. I don't know if he's still with us, but this is a crazy weird example. Uh, it's called the Feynman Fjord Cove. Feynman, I, I don't know if it's to do with Richard Feynman or if it's just a brand brand name. And the colors are awesome. I mean, there's got some, it's got some funk to it. So we have a compressor style case inset bezel. Feynman looks like a uh, brass, maybe polished brass. I don't know, judging by the, or maybe it's copper for all I know. Um, asymmetrical subdial arrangement. I think this is a micro brand. Raymond is still with us. That's good. And the light plate, it's a beautiful emerald green, whatever they're using. And the, the case, the actual case itself looks very Omega esque with the Laya lugs and also very 70s. Has some chronostop vibes that we've already discussed earlier on in the show. Rubber strap. And I think he also showed a shot of the case back. How cool is this? 68 pieces, 200 meter water resistant founders edition, YK 100. I don't know what that's about. If that's the movement or if that's a reference number of the serial. Cool looking watch though. It's really nice. I think this one probably does the best justice to the, to the, the, uh, the dial. Very seldom you see subdials arranged like this with a you know funky little seconds hand. Must be difficult to hack. I think it must get a bit confusing when it comes to hacking seconds. <laughs> uh, Feynman is Singapore. Thank you, Raymond. I got that completely wrong here. Eh? Ming vibes a little. <laughs> Feynman's last theorem. <laughs> uh, you guys, you guys are allowed to have fun. I mean, three hours into the show, you got You got to start pulling. I was actually watching a Feynman lecture the other day. He's a he's a good guy. Really charismatic, good fun to listen to. Hitting the whiskey again. Mm. Talking about teal. Thanks for that, Raymond. So teal stainless steel, <laughs> named after the owner's son. Is the owner that the, the owner called his son stainless steel? I can understand steel is a good surname, but stainless as the middle name. I don't know. <laughs> I like it, Raymond. Thank you. ETA two eight nine five. And, and Stephen saying, thanks for the amazing streams. Oh, pleasure. Stunning how 36 to 42 little wrist pieces can be so different. Yeah, right, right. There's so many factors that play into it. And as mentioned in the chat, lug length is the big, is the clincher. It's the thing that, that does you know, finalize whether or not the watch is going to work with you. Um, Feynman Fjord, pay attention to this, called the Cove. I love, and it's also got some machine finishing around there. I don't even know how this dial is set, if it's floating on top or I don't know how it's done. There might be some little platforms that it's sitting on, but still really cool. I like it. Feynman is the owner's son. Okay, got it. Raymond, thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, my Ted, he loves a talk. <laughs> oh, Hans. Okay, carrying on next. Raymond, thank you. We're going to be closing up shop in the next like 30 minutes, I think, at this rate. We're doing pretty well. Um, this was something, I don't know how this came into being. Maybe it was a throwaway line that I made. Uh, 60 at the top of the subdials. Are we talking about this little symbol here? Does that represent 60? Very interested in knowing that. Interesting. Um, so I mentioned something about father-daughter or, or um, husband and wife or relationship, you know, any kind, of, any kind of relationship with wrist shots. And Rob sent in two his and hers. This is him and his daughter's swatch. Um, and it's really interesting seeing, getting, getting into this hobby, you know, this age, what you can do. So here we see, uh, what are they, what, what did I say? I can't remember the reference. It's a blackout swatch. And this looks like a jellyfish with some funk to it. Camo, camo, like finish. <laughs> I'm useless with swatches, I gotta say, but you know, we've got to give our love and thanks to swatch as a brand. Hans, if you're fading, you can drop out by all means. Don't worry. I'm the same. When I fade, I, I, I switch off completely. So you can, you can love and leave us if you like. Uh, we only have, what, 15 or so left, and they're going to be a couple of duplicates that I'll be able to flick through as we come to the end. Some beautiful watches to end the show off too. Moses, Breguets. We're going to save some of the best for last, as we normally do, right? Uh, so father and daughter swatch. And there was another example here. How cool is this? Where we have 
Father's Day swatch, Mr. Jones watch. I believe that's the, the yeah the, the the last laugh. So this is the Mr. Jones last laugh watch. How the, do you even tell the time? What? How do you even read the time on this thing? Nine and five. Whoa! What? The jump hour? I don't. I don't know. Very cool though. Yeah, Mr. Jones. I think he's based in London and he's got a bit of a a boutique and he makes these pieces individually. I love this. That's if that's the way you tell the time. I'm in for that. That's really nice. And then another example here. What did I call this? I don't think I saved it. Or did I? Was this the same model that we just saw a second ago? It's called the Big Bold Black. Okay, thank you, Swatch, for that. So it's great. As Thomas mentioning in the chat, it's it's lovely seeing family sharing watch passion. I mean, it's I'm all for it. I, um, I can't say I have any family members who are into watches at all. Uh, you know, as an enthusiast, you go in and you you say, you know, these are awesome, and you you eventually rub off on the family members. But as far as family members of mine, nah, no one's no one's into watches like I am. So it can suck when you're just sitting here wanting to share the stuff with the family, but they're not interested, you know, and that's, that's where the hobby is great. That's where this community is cool because we get to share all this stuff. Uh, yeah, right. The, the shaken watch it looks like one, right? Shaken skull or whatever they call them these days. Yeah. Good fun. Good, good fun. So I'm thinking I'm going to leave Russell to last. He's got to save tradition and going to share his watch at the end. I'm talking about Mexico, it must sell well in Mexico. Yeah, for sure. I mean, this is probably where the inspiration came from. So, jumping next to Smoke Eater, he sent an email to our man Thomas, who's in the chat. And I really like this. You sent this to me at like midnight last night, Thomas. I was lucky to find it this morning. So thank you for sending it in. This was a shot that he took nursing back to health. He's got a baby bird. I have no idea what the bird is but it's, it's resting on his two-tone two submariner. Talk about diverse wrist shots. We have it all here, people. We have dogs, cats, you know, fathers, daughters, husband and wives, guitars, cars, shoes, and now we have baby birds. I think I should grab one of the hedgehogs outside and put it on my watch for the next show. What do you think? <laughs> bird shot. <laughs> there we go, Justin. It's, this is, yeah, bird shot. That's, that's it. So are we going to do this from now on? Are we going to call them <laughs> bird shot? Uh, that's great. One of the best comments there. Um, it's having a on. <laughs> it's having a something on his bluesy, as Hans says. Yeah, right. Nothing can beat this. It's a win. It's a real win. Question is if it's a real bird or not. How did he get this bird? To, it's fantastic. I'd love to know the 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 breed of the bird. Um, I do love my animals coming out of Africa. I, you know, it's almost like you're indoctrinated into learning about animals when you come from there. So you tend to always follow up and like to learn. So uh, the the chick was has adopted the owner, right? Right? Please don't make this a thing. Or in Sun says, bird shot. Freaking love it. That was so good. That's from Justin. Brilliant. Just brilliant. Simple but effective. You know. So Smokey, to thank you, Thomas. Thank you for emailing this to me. It's a winner. I don't think this is like a one in a million shot. Oh God! Now you know what we've done. We're going to get parrots and everything next bloody show. Watch, just wait and see. <laughs> Hope there's not going to be another plot on the dial of the bird flies away. Right? That's the thing. Another cyclops, should we say? A white cyclops. Yeah. Talk about talk about it blending into the upholstery. Beautiful. <laughs> God, I hope we don't have parrots and mice and rats and everything soon, because then it's just going to be a disaster. Call it the nature show. Uh, chicks and watches. Yeah, bluesy and a birdie. <laughs> Thomas and blue shirt, synchro comment right there. It's great. Uh, yeah, going to carry on through. Get yourself a cheetah's shot. Yeah, next one. To Tarek, and he had some cool pieces to share with us. So, Smoke Eater, thanks for that. Whoops. This is the only modern GMT we've had on the show, and I think he just picked this up. <laughs> watch, watch meme show. <laughs> it all started with a fox. <laughs> oh, yeah, the, the fox barking outside my window. Yeah, I wish it was it's so annoying. It wakes me up. It freaking wakes me up at like three in the morning sometimes. So carrying on. Batman Jubilee or Bruce Wayne or Batgirl or whatever you call this thing. Um, it's, a, it's a charm. Eric Clapton with the birds. Back in the day, right? Back in the day. Get a swan from Hot Fuzz. God, it's funny. I can just see it now. We're going to get pigeons and freaking parrots, and it's all going to be happening soon. Love the Batgirl or the Bruce Wayne on the Jubilee. It's one of my favorite GMT models out there. Just so utilitarian. 
egalitarian. It's got it's got a the Jubilee bracelet just hits differently on a GMT. And uh, I think it deserves this. Some are going to say no to that, but I think it really does deserve it there. Car sharks on a diver. Yeah, right. I mean, there are lots of deep sea divers out there. They're going to go fishing and put like a parrot fish on the watch. And God, what have we done? Next up from Tarek, what are we going to look at? A Breguet Classic. Funny, I called this one, I called this one standard and I, the other one I called angle. I believe this one is the angle. Yeah, this one's the standard. Jeez, I was three in the morning when I was saving these. Breguet 4063, I love this. This is a new model, I believe, with the, the uh, isometric guilloche. Guilloche. It's one of their latest things they're playing around with. Only Breguet can do this. Only Breguet with, with guilloche. Uh, JCB's pie in the sky. Yeah, I mean, JCB. He, uh, for long story short, he um, struggles. JCB... Hot take. He runs a show. I join in on a Tuesday, and uh, the hot. If you just Google, if you YouTube, actually, for everyone watching, go into YouTube on the search and type in the hot take. I'll type it in here for you just while I'm at it. The hot take. Here we go. And uh, he is dreaming of getting the new Batman on an oyster bracelet, but it's impossible, like pathetically impossible can't even get it through friends anymore that's how bad the ad's are treating people today anyway so break a classic you can't get much better than this thomas i know you're probably drooling at this example everyone's still laughing at the bird shot <laughs> god bird shot it's beautiful uh this is just a charmer absolute charmer and from an angle you get the coin edging you've got the finishing the texture on the dial nothing like Breguet. The sector arrangements, the look how the Gearshay works in different lighting. It looks so good. And the best part of all is that the way this texture has been done, it's an arrangement of vertical and horizontal lines that's given it this finish, which is insanely cool. And this this looks like a um an AP sub what would you call it? Uh hold on. Machine turn, I don't know. I'll never get it right. There's two different kinds. There's Gilleshe, and then there's there's the other one. Um, yeah, but this looks like an AP arrangement with the squared components. Very grid-like, you know? Stunning. We're not done yet, though. Moser Endeavor. I think he just picked this up recently with a Fume dial. Yes. So he has the Endeavor, and he has the, um, the other one, God, the Ventura. The endeavor he just picked up with the Fume arrangement. Marcello, oh my goodness, Marcello, don't tell me you're doing work now at that two in the morning. Welcome. It's been a while. Yes, for sure it has. So good having you here, man. Um, 20 past two in the morning we are in Italy at the moment. Welcome. Um, I really hope you're not doing any rendering work. God, solid works. Uh, yeah, carrying on in the chat. I'm missing you. Thomas saying love the classic. It's just class. Yeah, I agree. Fully agree. Mo but the question is, what would you do between Moser and Breguet? What's what would be your poison? Uh, you know, if it was me, I might go with Breguet just because I love watches and their history. So for me, I think this just captures. Uh, this, but the thing is, though, in the next twenty years, Moser is going to be right up there too. So it's like this is the delayed fuse. This is going to be something that's going to have the same amount of acclaim eventually. Breguet just has the history to it. So I would probably jump on the Breguet at this point, but I just love that. I mean, they've been around. They pioneered so much in the space. Uh, yeah. James is still watching. I can't, it's, what, it's half past two in Paris at the moment. How are you still doing it, James? Welcome back. Um, yeah, loving it. Moser Endeavor, the brown Fume dial is just class. It's so, so nicely done. I would lose hours just looking at that Breguet. Ray, Rick, I think we would all be the same. Um, love the coin. Can't beat it. Can't beat it, James. Um, anyone else in the chat that I've missed? I'm liking the chat is, is like quietening down a bit. So I can sit back, take another hit of my Peruvian and carry on through. We've got the next shot up of an I Ooh, ooh, love this. Chronograph arrangement again, IWC. IWC is doing some good stuff at the moment. That 43 millimeter big pilot has piqued my interest. Um, taking it from the Peruvian. I think I need to get all the different coffees. I need to get Colombian and Nicaraguan and got to get some more. Af I've got Ethiopian. I need to get some more African blends out there. Look at the loom on that dial. God, it's insane. And IWC, they just they just nail it. Um, the 43 millimeter pilot is one to look at. 
Uh, mezzanine, still here, multitasking. Valeria, I think I think I saw you earlier. Welcome back, Valeria, if you've left us. Carry on through to the other side. Yeah, break on through to the other side, I mean to say. Uh, yeah, my new favorite drink. Chat Mark is still with us in the chat. Thanks, Mark, for being here. I know it's like, it's super late. Um, Negroni is cool. Negroni is also dangerous. Speaking as an enthusiast, Negroni is dangerous. I have had some... Yeah, experiences that are not worth repeating here. Um, what else has he sent? A sky Dweller. How's this for a shot? Sky Dweller, Skyline. I, I don't know where this is based. Uh, I think Tarek is, I think he's based in the States. I can't, I'll, I won't be able to remember. But I mean, the Sky Dweller on a Jubilee, I think this is the latest edition that they've just brought out. This speaks to me. I think this captures the Sky Dweller very well, being that, you know, pilot watch of that time the whole 50s aviation history and the, the class of that age and that era this should have been the original gmt watch if they had the technology to do this back in the day so yeah yeah is negroni as dangerous as captain morgan yeah i've never been much of a, of a rum fan shaitan negroni is bad especially when you're with a group of friends be warned ladies and gentlemen uh yeah she's got a smile that seems to me <laughs> uh loving the music quotes so beautiful arrangement. I think this one has a black dial. Yeah. That sweet child of mine, right, Eric? Yeah, I think it is. Uh, black dial looks amazing too, nice and subtle. And you've got all the all the flair that you would like out of a date just with this piece. The, the, the fluted bezel being larger is great because it actually means you can turn it. It has some function to it, which is it's a seriously good watchmaking on, on Rolex's part. Jubilee bracelet and fluted bezel works in tandem, making for a superior dress watch in this category there. Uh, take my hand. <laughs> These music references, I gotta love it. Joshua, welcome. Um, thanks for the super chat. He said, my favorite drinking buddies, I mean watch buddies. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. It's bad. Saturdays, I tell myself it's when I'm allowed to enjoy a dram of something. And it works pretty well. During the rest of the week, I'm, I'm hammering myself with workouts and, and protein shakes and things. Weekend, I can relax a bit. Uh, Springsteen and, you know, Justin, that's a good point, saying Sky Dweller or the Super Date Just. I really like that. If you're thinking of that time, that era, you know, you had like Turnomatic and what was it? It was, a turn, it was Turnomatic, Turnograph, yeah. Turnograph, then, then having Super Date Just works well in that era so maybe that would actually fit the bill of the sky dweller pretty well the super date just and then of course you got your annual calendar and it's it's great fun great fun um right next up what else do we have batman with a view from Tarek again or should i say the jubilee james if you've been watching the whole time i think we all have a, a slight snigger and a sneer for our man jcb who can't get his hands on one of these it's sad it is sad that he can't and you know, I still think you should just give it time. You should just hold it out. Nothing will replace the watch that you truly want. So as much as he's interested in the full black dial GMT and all of those models, I think you should just keep on waiting. So carrying on through, uh, Marcello is saying, I forgot to tell you that I am getting a Ming 1709 as my graduation watch. Ooh, you'll receive it in nine months. I wish I knew what the 1709 looked like. <laughs> I know what Ming looks like, but... Yeah, fantastic, Marcello. I can understand the designer's love for that piece. It is beautiful. The fact that it's still a micro brand, but has all this, this hype around it too. Beautiful movements. There's lots to appreciate. Yeah, huge congratulations, Marcello. And you picked up that Santos for your birthday a while back. Mason says, birthday next month, I'll have to get a bottle of Jack Daniels single barrel. Oh, Mason, Mason. There's so many cool whiskeys out there to enjoy. Get yourself... Get yourself a Glen Morangy 14 or a, a Glen Dronach, another Glen Dronach 14 or something, something a bit more special, you know, it's, just get something with Glen in it and you're in good shape and make sure that it's, it's older than 12 years. You'll love it. It'd be like 40, 50 bucks, maybe 60 bucks. Okay. Carrying on in the chat. James is chatting about uh, drinking alcohol and Negronis and yeah, an acquired taste for sure. We're going to carry on through. It's got more to go. Um, this is a shot. This this is in the States somewhere, I'm guessing, right? Someone help me out. Another shot of this IWC in presentation. Tarek began with a huge range of IWCs back in the day. He had a Portuguese and a handful of others. 
Glenn Fiddick, another one. Yep. <laughs> Any Glenn will do, Koji. That's it. Quote me. Um, I've never, I've, I've experienced Glenn Fiddick, and I gotta say, out of all the Glens I've tried, that's one that just hasn't, hasn't hit me at all. Uh, there's some, there's some brands out there that are too mainstream for their own good. Um, I haven't found a good Glenn Fiddick yet. Talisker is a goodie. Talisker is a goodie. I've, I have a Talisker 10. It's fantastic. Excellent value for money. Um, so just enjoy everything about this watch. The balance is superb. Date complication. Notice the date windows at the base of the dial. Yeah. Highland Park, another good example. <laughs> Poor old Glenn. Highland Park is another good example. One of the oldest distilleries in Scotland. And beautiful. If you like the peaty, smoky whiskies, get yourself a Highland Park. Great acclaim. They, they win lots of awards. Um, okay, next and last but not least from Tarek is a date sub. Judging by the look of it, it uh, looks like a six digit, not not a one two, but a, a one one six six one zero. Maybe I'm totally wrong. No, it looks like quite a fat case. So yeah, that's it. Beautiful presentation. I think this is the only modern Submariner we featured in the standard steel. For no, we had a look at the Hulk. We had a look at the Hulk. Uh, James, James saying that we're going to have to get me Negronis during the live stream. Oh, that'd be something. It would be entertaining. But I need lots of Negronis to get me. The beautiful, the beautiful thing about whiskeys is that, you know, it doesn't take much to get you plowed because it's 40% plus, 43% in most cases. With Negronis and gin and stuff, you have to have lots of it. Um, and in succession, when you're sitting with a group of friends, it's not a good idea. <laughs> Triple distilled. Lagavulin 16. Yes, that's from Valeria, Scotland. Lagavulin 16. And I've never tried a Japanese whiskey, but I'm seeing a, a Yamazaki. Yamazaki 18 from Koji. Lagavulin I need to get. Uh, it's my next next dram I'm going to jump on. It's funny. The names I'm learning over time. Tarek, thank you for sending these in. We're going to jump to Thomas. Uh, to oh, so watching World Finance. Right. Let's chat about this for a sec. So I believe this is Hong Kong. Ladies and gentlemen, help me out. Watching World Finance does a lot of traveling. So I f it's either Singapore or Hong Kong. Someone help me out. James, you'd probably know better than me um, and most of you who are based around that part of the world. Um, and this is my absolute favorite freaking JLC on the planet that he's wearing at the moment. Makes me super jealous. Actually, of all the watches on the show, this is probably the one that I would want the most. Uh, it's a deep sea chronograph. Oh, it's just so much to love about this. Lesser well known, Hans says. So you yeah, were chatting, Nina Simone. Says, okay, sister, that's something else. Um, thoughts on brandy? I can't handle the few. Yeah, brandy is its own kettle of fish. I've gotten to enjoy it better over time. I think brandy is nice, sweeter, has a similar kind of kick to whiskey, but then it is. Yeah, it's an acquired taste, like so many other things. Uh, Nina Groni, God, you guys. Need a special ID guy whiskey. Yeah. If if you want to if you want to know my special editions, I'm Glenn Morangy is my number one. I absolutely adore Glenn Morangy. Uh, I need to get up into the tiers. I need to go for a um, a Quinta Ruban next, which is a 14 year old. It looks amazing. And then there's the the one up after that, which is a purple box, which also looks fantastic. Yeah, I'd love to experience them. But the whiskey names is what blows me away. Coming out of Africa, it's all about wine. Okay. So you get your Shiraz and your Merlots and all that stuff. And you learn, I mean, you go wine tasting. That's what you do there. So coming here, tasting the whiskeys, learning about single malts and learning about whiskey versus, you know, um, rye and everything there. And uh, the, the names, the Glen Fiddich, Glen Dranak, Glen Morangi, uh, the Glen Keith and the Tamnavulan and Highland Park. There's so many and Lagavulan and it just does not stop. It's fun though. Whiskey is a fun hobby. <laughs> uh, whiskey being, yeah, port finish is great. Port cask, that's the reason why I want to try it. I'll, so getting back to the JLC Chrono, let's talk about watches again. Um, let's also chat about Nogroni in the chat, and I'd love to experience Nogroni one day. That's a Negroni without any alcohol. So talking about this, I don't just, what is to say? It's, it's a stunning example of a diver of the, the late 50s, um, it's a diving chronograph, so it's it's a very peculiar example. It lets you time your dive as well as using your bezel for the function. Has this little indicator telling you that the chronograph is running and you can't use it when you're in the water. Just great. All the president's men. Hold on a sec. Great film. It is a good film. Uh, Robert was a good-looking man. I think he's still a good-looking man today. Uh, he's doing a good job. 
And the fact that he got that, what was it a 1680 sub, I think? And then the film All is Lost with a SKX 009, if I remember right. Yeah, he's worn a car. I think he also wore a date just in another film back in the day. I don't know how we got to talk about Robert Redford. JLC. So technically, it's as far as I know, James, it's not as correct me. I think Eric would probably know better than all of us. Um, brandy and Coke in Pretoria tonight, Eric. Oh, shame on you. Uh, I don't know if it's a compressor case, if you would call it that. It's a diving chronograph. And these weren't a big deal back in the day. Diving chronographs, no one knew about. JLC, once again, pioneering this, this technology back then. Um, beautiful pump pushes. There's just so much to love. I would happily add one of these to the collection, given the choice. It's just right up my alley. Speaks everything there. But he sent in a few more. He sent in a shot of a Santos, would you believe? Uh, this is an, this might be an, uh, not a Gelby, is it? Uh, it's it's not a um. What's the other Santos? The it's not a Musk Musk Ducati of any kind. It's a two tone Santos from like the eighties, I would imagine. Uh, maybe someone can correct me with this example. Funny enough, we're getting close to the end, ladies and gents. Three and a half hours in, we're doing pretty well. Carrying on <laughs> in the chat. Uh, sake is very interesting. I'd love to try it, Glenn. That's it, Eric. Glenn Lagerman. Just chuck all the words in there. Uh, yeah, pump pushes, diving chronograph, good watch movie. Yep, yep, that's for sure. Carrying on in the chat, I'm missing you. Diving chrono is very rare indeed. It sure is. Uh, Gelby, Thomas, I believe it is. The, it is the Gelby. That's it. Good point. So this is the Santos Gelby, which is what's the film? Ah, not Wolf of Wall Street. Come on, it's Wall Street. Wall Street from 1981. No, 85. When was that film made? But this feels like the Wall Street watch from back in the day. It's great. Love the two-tone. We've chatted about the Santos already today. Quite a Cartier heavy show, actually, all things considered. And the last watch he sent in was the Yachtmaster. And this piece doesn't get the love it deserves. I believe it's the 37 mil. Correct me if I'm wrong. But the Yachtmaster just hits differently. The stunning bezel, polish. Um, had some good hands on time with one. And there's lots to take in and enjoy. Uh, Valeria, what have I missed? Uh, getting a, a that's a good, I can, I'm not going to even try and pronounce it as La, La Parag for my birthday. Here it's very special. Yeah. I'm really enjoying whiskey. Whiskey is fun. Should get into it. It's it's something good to, <laughs> I need a refill. <laughs> it says, uh, yeah, very nice, Valeria. Love a few drops on, a, on fresh oysters. Uh, it was good, right, James? The Cartiers, I love the variety. I'd love to see a Cartier only collection. I mean, John Goldberger. He has just an insane, it was so good watching that Revolution Watch clip. Um, the PH is pronounced with an F. <laughs> uh, the Lafroig. Lafroig. Ah, oh, got it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, oh, me and my bloody descriptions. Right. Beautiful. Two tone, rose gold, underrated. I believe it's 37 mils. I might be wrong. There are a couple of examples in this category of, the, of this model. Not done yet, though. Let's look at Tao. He's normally in the chat. Uh, we're going to look at quite an interesting pairing of two watches here. We've got an Explorer 42 on one end and a Zen U50 Mother of Pearl dial DLC coated, I believe, on the right. Now, our man Tao is German. He's the guy who owns the Lunger One, the original Lunger One. And seeing these two pieces together, they do work in a way. I can see why he liked the Zin. It's a serious outlier. And that's the one that gets the, the coverage for this show. The dial with the DLC coating, he wanted a black watch and we were chatting about it together. I think he wanted, I, I mentioned that he should get the Zenith um, A384, that full blackout A384. Can't remember what it was called, Dark Lord or something. Um, but he decided on this piece and as far as funk goes We've got another watch full of funk uh chatting about wall street sorry lafroig got it thanks for that thanks for correcting me and mason saying wall street 1987 by oliver stone thank you um thanks for the correcting as well i can speak dutch and a few other languages but uh, i can't i can't speak scotch uh, i recommend we arrange for me to get the newest youtube watch celebrity Co pontiff's brew is that even a thing i wouldn't even know shaitan if that's a thing uh yeah that didn't remind me of a Petri dish. You know, that's just it. I, this could actually go down as the Petri dish edition. Ah, coffee's working. The Petri dish dial because of that mother of pearl. Um, looks great on black though. Uh, 
Mother of Pearl is hit or miss in some pieces, I think. Same with Meteorite. But on some of these, I think this is the most, uh, next to that other Zen that we saw, I think from Demetrius a couple of weeks back, that distressed one, whatever they did, they scratched up the dial like crazy because the story goes, this is a complete lie, by the way, the watchmaker was his last day and he decided, no, screw this and just destroyed the dial. Uh, no, it would have been a funny story, but um, this was the counter to that with the Mother of Pearl arrangement. Uh, okay. Good. <laughs> James, thanks for that. Now no, I don't want to drink my coffee after reading that. Uh, taking a hit from, from the Peru again. So Shratan says it's a cheap, freeze-dried, ready coffee with his name slapped over the label. <laughs> cheap and nasty. Thanks for that, Shratan. Oh, James, thank you for that comment. That puts all sorts of thoughts in my mind as I'm going. If you drink enough scotch... Eventually, you'll end up speaking it, Harry. That's very true. That's very true. Okay, so what should we do next? Um, I was wondering if I should leave a G-Shock for last from our man, Valeria. Or maybe I should share it here. Since you're in the chat, Valeria, let me share it here. And then we can jump to some heavy hitters to call the show the end. Now, I believe Valeria has... This reminded me of Cape Town for a while, actually. That looks like Lion's Head. Anyway, so he's doing some exploring, some beach exploring, and this is in Scotland. So uh, amazing to see Scotland with blue skies for once. I think you know throughout the year, this is the one day of the year when they get a blue sky, uh, which is great. The beaches in Scotland, by the way, are some of the best in the world. In fact, um, small known fact, because they aren't explored enough or tourist destinations, I love the fact that, once again, the phone camera catches the, the background and not the watch. Just beautiful. G-Shock rabbit hole. Yep. This is just the standard. Someone help me with the reference. I know you guys know your, your G-Shocks pretty well. Um, what was I saying? Amnesia. Coffee-induced amnesia. Carrying on. So oh yeah, he's testing the watch's water resistance. All of all of like a third of an inch down there. That's what he said in the, in the email to me. Um, Va Valera. So I always get your name wrong. I call you Valeria. I'm thinking like from some folklore place. Um, yeah, I was talking about the tourism and the beaches in Scotland. They have some of the best kept beaches and they are out of this world. The water is crystal clear, especially when you get to the, I believe, northwest coast. No? I don't know. Eric will be able to back me up. There we go. The, the Lothian beaches and the... I'm going to butcher these names. I'm sorry, Valeria. I am Scottish, but I can't get it right. And the Northumberland are amazing. Okay, got it, got it. Malaria. Hans says, yes, malaria. Who doesn't like a little bit of malaria in their coffee? Can't be Scotland. Uh, why isn't he wearing a sweater? You know, right? That's it. That's it. 5,600. James, James knows his references. So this is the... How do you even know that? Is this just the, the OG? This is the original, right? It's one of the originals. East Coast. Eric knows the stuff better than me. Northeast. I don't know. I don't know what I'm saying. Yeah, I miss my beaches. I miss sand on my beaches. That's another thing. Stones, I'm not a fan of. Uh, the Rolling Stones I like, but stones on beaches, not my jam. Okay, so we've chatted about all sorts, G-Shocks and whatever else. Are we going to end the show? Should we end the show with Russell or end with Ty? I think Tyler, our man Turbo T2, if he's still with us, he's going to end off the show with a beautiful shot. So Russell sent in some great points about watch collecting at the beginning of the phases. Of course, this show hasn't hasn't covered watch collecting very well today. It's just been a, as usual, freaking diverse selection of all sorts. Um, what he tried to do in his email to me today, and I do apologize, Russell, I haven't categorized every watch that you saved. But this example was one of those buy it now pieces where it was the launch of a boutique. Uh, it's in steel. It's rare and attractive. It's a Patek. So just buy it. And that was his uh, his call for this one. And it's a cool watch. We featured this the other week, I think. I like that PP. Mm, it's nice. Uh, the standard one is a black dial. This one has the floorboard or the sound deadening texture you would have on your walls. Um, also just love the fact that it's a carousel and that the numerals rotate around the dial instead of just being flat on. It gives it a bit more of a classic feel. Great under the radar everyday wearer. That date window, though. I can't. Why can't they just... Just put a frame around it or something. You know, do, do something, Paddock. You know you can. You can do it. Another hit from the, the Freemason watch, Hans says. How's that? The whiskey is almost finished. Um, very Art Deco, for sure. 1950s-ish, 1950s around there. Um, taking a hit. I really like Russell's collecting strategy. He has an interesting taste. 
Next up, this is his infamous world time that took eight years of waiting to pick up. And it is relevant to the show at the three hour, 40 minute mark um, that this watch took a long time to be made for him individually. Rose gold with its own, you know, the way they do the grand faux enamel on these are, it's just stunning. And your photographs are always amazing, Russell. You just capture it so nicely. So we can see that level of effort and texture that goes into these handset. Uh, are you talking about this one, James, or the last model? I also like how they've done the hands here with the hour being this, the circle. So it lets you admire the components on the dial too. Um, doesn't doesn't need to frame that one. I think PP got that right. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a bit pedantic when it comes to frames and dates. I don't know. It's just something that's happening with me today. You've got to frame your date. Does that make sense? Yellow Raincoat, welcome to the show. Um, yeah, Yellow Craig Beach near Edinburgh. Thanks for that, Vera. The last model. Thanks, James. Yeah, it's awesome, but we're not done yet because he does have an awesome select. I've only chosen three for the show, Russell. At the very beginning of the show, we featured your your uh, 5370. The hands are beautiful on this, I'd agree. Yeah. Kind of obelisk, obelisk with loom inside them, and they're white, so they're easy to read on the dial. Contrast's good. The length of the hands, superb. The fact that they cover, oh, it's great. Very skin, sorry that I'm zooming in and out. Very skin diver-esque, the way that the, <clears throat> the inside plots are arranged here this carousel setup. Okay, I'll stop with the moving around. And last but not least, we get a lumen off. This is just cool. This is so, it's way too cool. As far as collecting lungas, these two are just, yeah, wallpaper stuff. Always wallpaper stuff. Hawaii in the center of the dial. Uh, duck patek on bread. Bird on a watch. Valeria, I'm taking a hit of whiskey just because I can't I can't understand that comment whatsoever. Uh, but this is yeah these these pieces especially the the lumen on the left is my one of my favorites. Datagraph is a charm. And seeing that in the dark, I would edit this photograph and make it even darker for us to see. But then I'd probably crash the preview page. So yeah, it's a bit of a downside. The last of the whiskey going down the hatch. This Tam Levulin is amazing, by the way. Sherry finish. I will never say no to. Yeah, stunning. What can you say about these two pieces? They are just outliers. They're their own beasts. And they came out around the same time, I think, around about then. Okay, so finally, Russell, these are great. And we're going to end off with a Vacheron Overseas. As we know, it's James's favorite watch. And I thought I'd do that just to give him a bit of a middle finger. Uh, he, loves, he, he loves the fact that they are too Vatican and that the bracelets don't taper. And that the design he just doesn't love. So that's why it's going to be shared. But the beauty of the photograph is not so much about the watch, but about the framing. Throw, throw bottle at Fox. <laughs> Eric, thank you. I will. I, I swear, like these, they, they camp out and they just, they just bark at each other throughout the night. It's the worst thing. Phantom 2010, Lumen 2018. Are you kidding? The Phantom was 2010. I thought it was a recent thing. Wow. So you're telling me that that watch is almost 12 years old. That is nuts. I can't believe they've been doing it since then. All right. So we're going to Vatican. This is this is cool. So he was just sitting in the kitchen, I think, if I remember reading the, the email, and he said the, the lights was just playing perfectly through the window, and he decided to throw in the VC rainbow to end off the show. I believe this is his most recent pickup. He traveled across. I think he actually traveled across country to pick up the watch, and he is loving it. He is absolutely loving it. And these pieces are definitely going up in demand and interest. I know there are a couple here who adore these pieces. <clears throat> Mark P is one of them who loves this watch. Got to say, the rainbow finish is stunning. It just adds that extra dynamic. And even a watch that looks like this, James, I think you can admire. Two Vatican. Valeria says, cheers, guys. Sleep well. Thanks. It's a pleasure for pronouncing my name right. Finally, yeah. Valera. I always call you Valeria. I make my life. Make my life too difficult. Huh? Chunking monkey, James says, yeah, the bracelet not tapering is a, is a downside. <laughs> my overseas, yeah, turbo. And this watch deserves to end off the show, I think. Uh, you know, it's, it's metaphorical, you know, silver linings, end of the rainbow, all that stuff. The show has just come to an end. So it's like, you know, you wait until the end and there's a rainbow at the end of it and there's a pot of gold and whatever. Yeah, alcohol and coffee have obviously done their work. Stunning though, really is nice. Thomas, thank you for the super chat. And Vincent, 
Vincent, I got to say, thank you so much for being a part and just listening into whatever, whatever the hell I was talking about through the show. And Thomas for being here the whole time. It's been a good time. We've really covered everything. It's been way too diverse, I think, for a show. Yeah, Vip and Zipper, you've been here too, Vip and Zipper. Welcome. I haven't said hi to you in the chat. James says, my question is, for the guys that love VC overseas or owned an AP, yeah, that's it. Eh? Who, so who owns this watch who has owned an, or experienced an AP? That's the thing. Royal Oaks, as much as I love the design of this piece, I find it charming. And the fact that it's, I'm just going to flip it over, see if I can turn it, twist. The fact that it has its own identity now, there's something about the AP bracelet that will always just win the day for me. I've been very fortunate to experience them, but but I mean, still, the Vacheron is, it's a charmer. It's an, it's an everything piece. You can put it on. I love the strap changing. There's so many variables. We've shattered about it to death, death over the years. Um, rare and attractive show, Russell. Thank you so much, sir. We have discussed quite a lot of rare and attractive stuff. I think one of the breakouts for me during the show were these these Cartiers. Cartier asymmetric, the, the Torture, the Sintre, and they're all in platinum. The, the I'm never going to get the Guiche, the, the Jump Hour. And the tank in platinum, that was really fun. Yeah, you just never know. <laughs> you just never know what comes up through these shows. And that's the fun. It's it's a gamble <laughs> whether or not you're going to waste your time or you're going to see something good. So that's the beauty. And Russell, your 5370 was at the beginning of the show. I love it on the burgundy strap, by the way. Everyone who's been a part of the show who um, has enjoyed the banter, thank you all so much for being here, for taking time out of your weekend to listen in. It's like on average quarter to three in the morning, wherever you are in the world. And it means a lot that you can do this and enjoy the show. I really hope you're all okay. You're all well, wherever you are based and um, have a superb weekend. As always, I'm going to close this off now, I think, before we get all sentimental. Oh, I love this piece. 53. I hope to experience one of these one day. I really hope because this is the grail chronograph for a lot of us. For me especially, I think this one would do it. It's platinum and everything. There's just too much to love. Okay, closing this off. Can I do this right? Uh, another thing before we end off. Um, we discussed a very interesting Ulysse Nadan freak earlier on. This being the razzle dazzle. And I can't zoom in any closer, but you can enjoy the way the movement spins on the base there. It's, it's a fun piece. That was like halfway through the show. Awesome. Awesome video. Thanks for sending this in. And to cap off, let's stop the screen share if I can. There we go. And just address all of you again. Thank you for taking the time out of your weekend to join in. These shows are always a treat. I love the fact that we have these breaks in between, so the inspiration comes back. It doesn't feel like a chore for all of us to listen in. You know, that's the that's the beauty and the fun. Um, and then the next show we're going to do, I don't know. I don't know what the next episode will be. If it's going to be wrist shot week or something auction related, maybe. Heaven help me. Uh, yeah. And that's it, like Christmas in July. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Once again, ladies and gents, um, look after yourselves. Another video coming out next week. I've got a handful of some funky ideas that I put together. And that's just it. The Watch Hobby continues. Enjoy the summer that you now have. If you're in the Northern, Northern Hemisphere, it's some beautiful weather for us to enjoy from time to time. So get out there, get some sun, get some exercise in, smell the roses. <laughs> and I will see you in the next one. Thank you all. Take care of yourselves.